Yes. Representative Bucco. Yes. Representative Como. Yes. Representative Fordelli. Yes. Representative Kirk. Yes. Representative McDonald. Yes. Representative Marsh. Yes. Representative Nelson. Yes. Representative Woodcock. Yes. And the chair. Yes. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. Thank you. Ten to zero. Thank you very much. And thank you. Okay. The first quarter budget to actual is um, we sent out to everybody and there are copies here. Did anyone get a copy? Are there any significant issues that we should be made aware of. Uh, any questions? Yes, because I'm going to find out. Um, I guess from a 
referring back to your um, email when you sent it out. Uh, my concern is that it's um, May 3rd and um, the first quarter is not complete um, due to hand posting of expenditures and revenues. Uh, so my concern is the timing and the amount of hand posting that continues to be needed. Um, and so that's an ongoing concern that I think can be addressed. Okay. Is there, I think part of that is, is due to, due to the short, short staff in the office. We're hoping to get addressed. We are working on that. That's a significant issue. Right, but I, uh, I don't think that that uh, uh, impacts the hand posting. If hand posting is hand posting if it's done by person X or person Z. Um, the amount of hand posting is the issue that I'm concerned about. Ron, can you explain to us why this, why, why we have to do so much hand posting? Is it because of the short? Shortcoming of our software is it because it isn't all included in the program, so it's automatically done as payments and, and receipts are coming. Well, the nursing home runs their own system for it begins it's very specific. So does the registry of deeds. So they they give me reports after they close their month. They give me reports. I need to put those. Those are revenues. There's the, the expenditures are all here except for the jail meals because that comes through a journal entry. But that's how we record the receipts for so that their their sales reports that's the gen but and also things like interest earned on so many accounts. It's, it's very minor what needs to be done by but it takes a while to, to gather the information, to compile it, then I have to put it into a format that the auditors like to see. And then I can put it into the system. And doing the budget, doing the first quarter stuff, when we, the first quarter, no one even has a budget. That's why you'll see a lot of stuff that's not even hitting the books yet, because some stuff we waited, had to wait until after the budget was passed. Regional appropriations, they didn't know if they were getting money, so we can't give them money until they find out. So it, the first quarter is the toughest quarter. The, that I, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know. There's no other way to get that information into the system except for by journal entries. The software posting that's used by the, the program that's used by the nursing home are not compatible. That that they don't transfer. Correct. They've never been tied together. Uh, thank you. Um, it's about five years ago, um, we got interface specifications from ACS uh, on the format um, that they would need to bring those transactions over from the nursing home system into the ACS system. Um, so we had that information. Um, that was before ACS was told not to talk to me anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, so this has been, that's been an ongoing issue for four or five years. Yes. Thank you. We seem to be always spending money to update software. I mean, we've been very supportive of that. And I, in my opinion, we've never gotten any further. I just can't believe in this day and age, with all the money we've poured into this, that this stuff cannot be generated and take so much time at your end. It just blows my mind. That's all. Thank you. Yes, Representative. Yes, I'm going to make the point that I made at the Executive Committee. I, I consider comparing the uh, amount posted to remaining balance as a percentage is a moderately useful piece of information, but it's nowhere near as useful as comparing it to prior year-to-date actual expenditures. And I will continue to lobby, and I will until I get it, to see a comparison of actual expenditures versus prior year-to-date expenditures to adjust for season. Yes, Representative Yes, Representative Mark, um, his uh, um, goal was to see first quarter expenditures for this year as well as first quarter expenditures for the prior year. Exactly. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Now, Chairman, is it possible to ask the administrator if it is possible and how it could be done versus debating it this way? 
We already talked about we that. that the executive committee. Okay. I wasn't putting that. Yeah. Part. We just wanted to put our comments into the record. Okay. Right. I I will look into it. No one's ever, to be honest. No one's ever asked for that reporting. So I, I don't know what it would take to generate that for you guys. I'm not saying I can't. I and I certainly won't say I won't do it. I just I don't. I can't commit right now until I find out. Yes, sir. Um, a different topic. Same topic, but a different issue. Okay. I meant. Just a question I may ask the administrator as regards the two uh, percentage balances left in the nursing home, uh, one in overtime and the second in the, the uh, expense for agency staff. Um, if it's, just look at the two numbers, um, uh, Mr. Are we are we looking at this the third quarter? Yes. And we're almost we're half half and two thirds. Is that because the way it's supposed to, or is this is it, no, looking um, for the last three? What's going to happen? That's all. Um, we we asked for a line item transfer uh, this Wednesday with the commissioners. They approved it. We had an executive committee this morning. We transferred eighty thousand into agency and eight hundred into overtime and nursing home. Um, we are reducing our agency staff. Um, ever so slowly, um, and um, we are hiring more uh, LPNs. We've hired two in the past uh, two months, and um, uh, sorry, two weeks. And we are also, um, when we, on April 1st, when we had our, our, our uh, contractual increases and our non union increases for staff. Yeah. Um, our HR system had to go around and have each staff member sign sign the piece of paper. Yeah. Um, um, that's the Department of Labor standards, so we follow that and it incurred some overtime. We have a little more overtime coming up uh, in May with our uh, with our employee uh, um, the benefits fair. It's when the health insurance come in and they, they talk to employees. They're setting all that up for employees, and uh, so this should, as far as overtime, it'll carry us through. Um, agency, we're keeping our fingers crossed by, by hopefully at the end of July, early August, we'll be zero agency, we'll be agency free, um, but we'll see where that goes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, maybe if you go over it by department and give us anything interesting or, or issues that you see that might be a concern. Perfect. Um, special fees and services, you'll see on page two, top of the page, uh, payroll services checkmate. Uh, we're a little over because that's an estimate. And also, it's um, this year, uh, pay uh, checkmate did our W-2s where we did it the year before because we had just come on with them in 2018. Uh, so that was a little expense we, we weren't anticipating. Uh, but they were all set on time and they're all correct. So. Um, as you look down to the, the victim witness, you'll see a lot of zeros in there or, or a lot of low salaries. Um, we expend the grants out uh, first uh, as far as salaries and um, there, are no, uh, there, there are no benefits in the, in the grant. The county pays 100% of, of the uh, Social Security retirement and the Medicare costs. Uh, registered deeds looks fine. Um, by the way, she just went out to bid on archival restoration, and uh, it, was, it was approved uh, by the commissioners, so she'll be enacting that, uh, I believe, shortly uh, for the archival restoration. Um, uh, pretty much, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, that crazy. We did have... Um, an education conference on page five uh, for the DPW 4193 uh, Those are for water licenses, so that's all up front. You know, I know it's a small amount, but it's it's at 51 percent. Uh, again, with dues, licenses, subscriptions, it's at 62 percent. And if you scroll down to 073 San Salt and Ash, that's at 56 percent, but. We don't anticipate any salt use in the next six months, so that should flip it out. But I may be wrong the way the weather is going to On page uh, six, 
on the IT 8000 licensing. Uh, a lot of the licensing is done up front, uh, so that should level out. I know we just uh, had a, uh, we just paid a Barracuda um, software licensing. Um, and page seven under the Carroll County Convention, um, the Delegation coordinators uh, line is at 40%, but um, we had a lot of meetings January through March. Um, that's where most of the expense was incurred. Um, under uh, page 8, under the Mountain View Nursing Home Annex, uh, maintenance and repair, we had a costly repair. Uh, to the boiler, uh, my right phone. Maybe it is. Yes. Uh, so that um, <coughs> that took a big chunk of three thousand dollars or so. We were holding out to the, uh, the boiler repair, but it had a replacement, but it didn't make it. Uh, nursing home, page ten, overtime, seventy-five percent. Uh, we did a line end transfer for 800, so it should be pretty well set there. Uh, nursing overtime, uh, it's, it's at 50%. Hopefully, uh, um, again, we, we don't know where that's going to end up. Uh, how he's watching it very closely. Um, you know, we'd rather pay overtime though than, than we do agency. Um, it's a little cheaper. Well, it's actually almost half of now. So, uh, you know, but sometimes, uh, um, it, you know, it's hard to get. Uh, we, we've been having quite a few call outs, so we, we'd rather fill it with overtime. Next page agency, I explained it a little earlier, we're at 72 percent, or actually a little further than that now. Um, 80,000 will probably keep us through till July, I'm thinking. Which is that um, Page 12, under special, special services department. Uh, 5193029, the criminal records. We we pay for it in blocks up front, uh, and we uh, and we request criminal records as as needed, and it's deducted from the from the New Hampshire State Police our account. Um, occupational therapy Part B is at 40 percent, but I believe that we we offset by the revenue because the it's a it's actually a good thing. Right. When, when this when this expense is up, it means our revenue is up. up as well. well that's about it. Thank you. Yes, it's Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the deeds, uh, archival restoration contract, is that the $300,000 that we talked about? And that's just for that amount of, of money and that amount of uh, restoration? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as per my uh, response to you when you sent out this, uh, uh, I'm also very interested also in uh, fourth quarter expenditures. I think it's very instructive to look at what is being spent from the fourth quarter as opposed to the other quarters. And we never get a sheet like this for the fourth quarter. So um, I tried to um, calculate that based on end of year and first and second and third quarter sheets that he did get. Um, and just according to what I was able to determine for the general fund, first quarter expenditures were uh, 3.4 million. Second quarter, excuse me, first quarter was 3.4. Second quarter was a little bit higher, three, almost 3.5. Third quarter was a little over 3.5. But the fourth quarter was uh, over $4.6 million in the fourth quarter in the general fund. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, the administration could uh, 
look at those numbers and get back to us in, uh, with uh, any reason for the significant increase in expenditures in the fourth quarter in the general fund. First, I would, I would like to apologize because I'm sure she would have given us that if I had asked for it that That's way. It. You had wanted the end, you said at the end of the year we don't get it, so I, I assumed you just wanted an update that's, on, the, that's on the, the end of the year. Right. So that's what I asked for. Yep. So I am sure that we would have received that had, had I asked for it um, that way. Right. So I do apologize if my no, misunderstanding No, no apology <laughs> necessary. But, um, but I, don't, I think it might be clear. I don't, is it possible to get a report from ACS, our software, for quarter by quarter, mm -hmm. totals for the four, four quarters, if that's something? That Not currently, but they, they're willing to make some custom reports for us that I can ask. Okay, if that's something that you're interested in tracking, I'm right. sure Just, we probably you know, can receive that, and then if you want to look at it that way. Right, this report is... Uh, you know, January uh, through March uh, for 19, 2019. You know, I'm, I was just looking for um, uh, October through December for 2018. Didn't I send you that? I think it was it was January through December. Oh, you just want the the fourth quarter. He, he just wanted the okay. fourth quarter. I think there's a column there that tells you what was in the. Not on the So, but I mean, that's something that we could generate if we needed it without too much. Work. I, I was just concerned about the uh, million dollar increase in general fund expenditures as it, as it appeared to me if my uh, determination of the fourth quarter was correct. Okay. Well, we can certainly get that report for you. Are there any other questions on the first four? Yes, Representative Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. On page two on the general fund line 103, um, payment in lieu of taxes, repayment, I see there's been no payments made. Is there a time frame to um, actually repay that? When the payment in lieu of tax funding was put in there, it was on a motion made by Commissioner Batson that it would be contingent upon receiving from the Department of Interior verification that the money was supposed to have gone to Conway and not Carroll County. We have not received such verification. I have talked to them in person. They keep telling me the money went where the money was supposed to go. This year, uh, Conway applied, apparently the correct process. They got money, but Carroll County got an increase in money. So they keep telling me that the money went where it was supposed to go previously. And until we get something in writing from the Department of Interior saying that it was supposed to go to Conway, I am not in favor of giving away money that belongs to the taxpayers of Carroll County. Well, well yes. um, this delegation appropriated the funding, and if they sent money to Conway this year, why did they not send the money to Conway in, in the past years that this this You'll have to covers. ask the Department of Labor, I mean the Department of Labor. I can give you the latest number. Thank you. I guess to be continued. <laughs> so are there any further questions? Thank you very much for your report. We appreciate it. Um, so I will move down to the Maker's Performance Audit, presented by Mr. Alan Penny. And we would appreciate it if it was on this side of the room to give it because our, our public, our, our public um, information can Maybe some of our answers will be in this. 
Well, this is just a quick summary of the report. Um, so, Alan Pennington with Nature Consulting, and I'm pleased to be here today to give you an overview of the findings. What I'm handing out is just a, uh, a, a quick summary uh, that I'm going to walk through to hit um, what I feel are the highlights of the report, and then I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. And I think there'll be enough copies for some additional staff who are here to have one also. Um, so, yes. Uh, you want to hold the questions until you get through the... It's your meeting. You can do it however you like. Um, I, I plan to take about 15 minutes to go through quickly, and then... I'd like to do this presentation first. Uh, and, and then we'll, we'll answer. So, what, what, what we were asked to do in this project was to review the prior study that we did in 2014 and give you an update on the status of implementation and then recommend any additional action that was needed, as well as to take a fresh look at the operations of the, uh, the county, specifically those, those um, functions directly under the county commissioners, uh, looking at staffing requirements, organizational structure, financial operations, HR, and technology. Um, the, the approach that we did on the project methodology, just to give everyone an understanding, is uh, we had some staff interviews and on-site time we collected data, we had follow-up interactions with staff, um, we looked at the implementation of the prior recommendation, we did a best practices assessment, we then developed our issues and developed the recommendations, we provided a draft report to both um, the county and the delegation for input and then uh, we finalized that and we're here today to talk about the findings of the final report. So on the slide that says key prior recommendations implemented. Uh, one thing I want to share and make very clear, because when you look at the report, you're going to see most of the report focuses on recommendations. There's a lot that's been implemented since the last study. Um, if you went back and looked at them or looked at this section of the report, um, you'll recall that we talked about uh, implementing a county administrative position and implementing financial policies and updating some of the HR practices. Um, changing the way you, they had some internal procedures done. A lot of change has occurred throughout the last four years. It doesn't mean there's still not um, some areas we're recommending additional improvements, uh, but you're in a very different position than you were before. And that includes the hiring of the administrator, the implementation of some key financial policies, um, adoption of a five-year capital plan, a hiring policy, um, updating employee files so that they're standard, standardized across the county, um, providing more supervisory training. All good things that have developed the organization and taken it forward to a different position. Um, and there are more in there that we didn't highlight on this summary, but I, I want to make sure that people realize that a lot has happened um, and there's a lot of progress that's, that's been made there. So the current study recommendation are the ones I want to focus on mainly. And there are a couple that I feel are most critical. Um, the first one has to do with the finance department staffing. We strongly believe you need to have three positions handling those functions. Um, and I know that since we finalized the report, you, you're in the process actually of hiring a third position. But um, when we talk about some of the issues that have occurred um, in the past, I think in large part it's been due to inadequate staffing and with the staffing that you have, not being able to focus on the highest level duties. Um, so we have uh, professionals in finance who are doing minute taking and other administrative tasks that are taking time away from the financial functions. Um, so that's a, a critical recommendation. We do believe you need to have three staff members in there. We've recommended a, a finance manager or controller bookkeeper and an admin assistant. Um, We've also recommended on staffing that you go back to the approach you used to have where you had a, a dedicated HR director at that high level. Uh, when we made the recommendation in the prior study for an administrative position, it was not to principally be a chief financial officer or an HR person, although they would oversee that and have input into that, but really to be a more strategic um, position managing the operations of the county. Um, and when we make these financial, these staffing recommendations, I also want to be clear that uh, you did not ask us to evaluate individual staff members. So we're not indicating anyone you've had performing HR functions or financial functions, uh, whether they're doing well or poorly. We're saying here's the structure you should have in place for the future to do the tasks that you 
um, need to have done. Um, and we continue, as we did before, to think that uh, the contract at IT is a good approach for you your right now. It's, it's very cost effective, and if you were to try to bring that in-house, which could be better in terms of being more responsive or increasing what you can do, you're, you're likely going to see a cost increase there. Uh, so staffing, those are the high-level recommendations there. Operationally, when we look at human resources, um, we continue to uh, stress that um, you should implement an HR information system to automate some of those HR processes. Um, updating the personnel manual, um, I think the last comprehensive update was 2013. Um, continue to look at the class and compensation specifically for non-union positions. I know from our work and, and doing some research and looking at the things that you, some of the issues that we addressed over the last year, there have been several positions where you've had concerns about whether they were appropriately paid. And you've made some, or I tried to address those on a one-off basis. You really you need to look comprehensively to say, are we at the right place in the market to attract and retain and keep the quality of employees we want? Because overall, you're generally very leanly staffed. Um, you know, we, you don't have a lot of excess staff, so you need to get ones who are competent, you can keep and, and uh, make the best use of all of them. Um, we are suggesting that personnel files be maintained centrally, um, have a, a more formalized training policy, and, and conduct exit interviews more consistently and use the information from them. Um, when you look at these recommendations, though, I, I want to put them into some context. For the most part, I, I would view these as tweaking operational practices rather than significant problems that exist. Um, there are things that um, you started implementing new policies, as we talked about, that's a strength. There's still more to be done. That's continuing that effort. Most of these things are pretty minor. Major issues, I think, really are the staffing. On, on finance, um, operationally, uh, of all the ones listed here, monthly reconciliations are the most critical bullet point on this slide. Uh, those have to happen in a more consistent and timely manner. There's just, that has to be a practice that, that the county gets behind and, and does routinely. Um, continuing on with policy development and updating financial policies, made great strides, <coughs> a little bit more to do there. Um, one suggestion that we have made in the report that is based upon best practice or prevailing practice in, in our work with municipal governments, but not a best practice in New Hampshire, so I just want to distinguish this, is the adoption of the budget. When you adopt a budget by the March end of March deadline, which is your statutory obligation as a delegation, you are already three months into a budget cycle, which means the county commissioners and staff have to have only nine months left of that year to implement any new initiatives or to really know what that budget is. That's problematic in a lot of ways. It's compliant it's, it, with your regulations and your statutes. No, no problems there. You're, you're well within your bounds there. Operationally, most organizations outside of New Hampshire, let me just qualify that, um, have a budget adopted before the fiscal year starts. Um, so you have the full year in order to implement. So we have suggested that you take an internal look to say, is there a way you could do your process differently to get the budget from the county commissioners to you and start looking at that with a goal of adopting it earlier. Understanding you have till March to be statutory compliant, but if you adopted it earlier, even in January or early February, you then cut back um, the, the loss of time in that first quarter. Um, it will address issues where, you know, once a budget's adopted, it has to be implemented into the system. You have to start setting up reporting. Uh, departments then know what they can really spend. Uh, it just would make things, I think, operationally work a lot better. Um, the annual audit needs to be completed in compliance with the statutory requirements. Um, this one, maybe there's some shared responsibility on both sides here. Um, and without going back over the last several years and rehashing that, it doesn't really matter as much as figuring out how do we move forward to get our audits done timely. Uh, because you do want to be compliant with the state requirements. It takes months for an auditing firm to do their audits. Um, they need time. So if you don't approve it until March, there's no way you're going to get it done in, in compliance with the statutory guidelines. Um, 
So what we've suggested is you try to include the, the, the money for that budget for the coming year in the prior year's budget. So in this 2019, ideally, you have the money set aside for the audit so you can approve that in December. It can start immediately after the fiscal year is closed and the accounts are reconciled. And that would prevent then you having uh, any issues regarding when the audit's approved in order to start moving forward. Um, it's just changing. You have to think, we, we need to be thinking a little bit more strategically here so that we can, can uh, be compliant there. Because they have a process they're going to go through and it's going to take them a certain amount of time. There's just no way to rush that without paying a lot more because all municipalities are doing their audits at the same time. So you know, they only have so much capacity. If you want them to speed it up, you're going to pay significantly for that. And that's not, not great. Um, we have uh, suggested expanding ACS access to departments. Uh, they should be able to look to see the status of their accounts. They should be held accountable for managing their budgets and no. Probably pushing <laughs> against you. Um, they they should be able to you know be accountable for managing that their budgets, know what their current status is. Um, we have suggested looking at a, a little bit more centralized and automated procurement function, and implementing some basic performance measures and reporting as we did before. So th that's sort of a quick overview of the report. Again, I just if I could summarize, I just say. If, if you're trying to look at the big picture and say, what are the critical issues in here? I think it's staffing, and I heard this morning you, you're moving forward both in looking at um, an additional position in finance and looking at uh, elevating to an HR director. I think that will go a long way to addressing what we see are the appropriate staffing requirements. And then you'll have the resources, I think, to really effectively implement these other things. Um, I don't believe the vast majority of these recommendations haven't been done or these items haven't been completed because there's resistance to doing them or an inability to do them. It's just we, we have to prioritize based upon the staffing we have and, and that's what's caused some of the delays there. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you have. Uh, yes, I would like to ask you to clarify your recommendation that personnel files should be maintained centrally. Okay. Is this a security issue that you identified, or is this merely an efficiency issue? Say that again. Is it, is it a security issue, which means it should be done yesterday, or is it an efficiency issue? Uh, it, it's a best practice issue. So, so my, my, our concern is that um, an, an employee's personnel file is an official document, and you have, to, you have to produce those in response to lawsuits and subpoenas and requests. Um, anytime you're going to take action against an employee, that's the file that matters. Um, if those are not maintained centrally, uh, what we have found is that you have information uh, that's being pulled from two different places. Information from the department that they've maintained and generated and information from the central administrative function that have to be put together to come up with the official file. Um, there really needs to be one file that needs to be maintained by somebody outside of an individual department. It's just, it's just a, an important base document. Um, it's not something that we've identified a critical issue in place right now. It's a more of a risk that, that if you don't have it. Now, in 2014, I know when we talked with staff and the HR director who was here at the time, it was a major issue then because every time they had a request for a file, they were sitting down, comparing documents, and creating a, a personnel file. Um, Quite frankly, I don't think that would have, at that approach at that time would not have passed legal muster if you were questioned because you can't create the file at the time it's supposed to be in place. Um, so it's really one just to manage your risk um, in terms of best practices. And um, when you have grievances file, the lawsuits file, you have a file to go to and say, here's what's been maintained and developed. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, Representative Puka. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you recommend three positions in the finance office, the finance manager, controller, bookkeeper, and an administrative assistant. And you put top priority on rec reconciling these bank statements, which apparently have not been done for six months, it says in this. So who, who, which one of these positions would take responsibility for doing that? It's, it's typically going to be a shared responsibility between the two professional staff. It's going to be the controller, bookkeeper, and the finance director. Ultimately, it'd be a finance director who's responsible for ensuring that that is done. 
whether they do them all themselves or they share that work with their staff. Uh, but that's the individual who should be responsible for ensuring that they're done time. Finance manager. Thank you. Representative Cordelli. Thank you. Um, follow along on those lines. Uh, uh, back in 2014, you indicated that was the highest priority and it was a critical item. It was. Um, and uh, we've seen that reiterated by the Department of Revenue Administration and our financial auditors as well. Um, you're indicating that that should be done um, centrally rather than by department heads, um, which is done now. Could you go into why you believe that it should be done by the uh, finance professionals centrally? Well, o only the individuals who are in the in your finance department have access to all the information. They're the ones they're they're the ones who control and will reconcile all the bank accounts. Um, but they're the ones who need to make adjustments as needed to the records in order to close up the, close out the month to make sure everything's reconciled. There, it should only be done centrally. You, you can't have other people making entries into ACS or uh, representing the county's financial condition. I mean, every community we work with, bank reconciliations are done in the finance. Um, uh, along those lines, um, uh, having the department uh, do it now, um, I, I think ties back to one of your other issues with uh, ACS, financial system access, um, because they don't have access to the financial system and they are basically keeping their own set of books, um, certainly in relation to expenditures. Um, and uh, wouldn't you indicate, wouldn't you think that that was uh, certainly problematic in terms of uh, risk and financial uh, awareness of what's going on in the organization. Uh, I think the de some departments did indicate that they keep you know, their own tallies of what they've expended because they don't have the day-to-day -day access to those expenditure levels. So yes, I think it's important that they have access to see what the current status of their accounts are. Um, uh, if, I mean, most organizations will hold department heads accountable for elected officials in the department is accountable for managing their budget. Um, to do that, if you're going to hold them accountable, they need to know where, they're, where they stand. Um, if they have access to the financial system, they know current exactly what's been expended, what's in process, what's remaining at any point. And so it's easy to say, you know, you should be aware of what that status is. You can do it through a monthly report you present, but then you're always, you know, several weeks out of date with that. And, most of the time, that's not a problem, but at some points in the year, uh, that could be difficult. Um, so I, I think it's important for them to know where they stand. Um, it's just uh, uh, there's no reason they shouldn't have access to their budget. It, it's view. It's not to enter, to change. It's just to see what that current status is. And um, almost every financial system has the ability, if it's set up correctly, to allow people to view without changing our access or changing or, or modifying. I think uh, Representative Kinnerick is next. Yes, yeah, just a, a relatively quick question. Um, when you talked about the budget adoption and the difficulty of being three months into the uh, year before it's adopted, one of the things, of course, that we face is that new, new reps aren't elected until November and we don't actually convene until in December. Would another solution be to shift the fiscal year to begin on April 1 instead? So that we still would you know, be working with the old budget till the April one, and still be able to run on our same schedule roughly, still getting it in by March thirty first, but having it in before the year fiscal year. It, it would be an option. Uh, I will tell you, changing fiscal years is a real pain. Got it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a massive undertaking yeah. for staff, um, and, and and I do understand you know you have new new individuals being seated. Um, that's not uncommon in other organizations also. Elections happen in November universally, almost everywhere. Um, and, you know, so there is some timing. Um, but, you know, it, it's also, uh, you know, it, it's, it's setting it up to understand, you know, this is what we need to do. And, you know, in an election year, maybe you can't do it quite as early, but, um, you know, because you're going to have new people seated every two years, not every year, I believe. 
Um, you know, so that's one thing to consider. But you know, there are a lot of organizations where a new, a new elected official comes in, and you know, they've got to quickly get up to speed on some things. And I know that's difficult. But um, you know, sometimes putting it off just because. I mean, you can stay with your adoption by the end of March, and you're legally compliant. I'm saying it's one way for the two groups to work together better um, to provide. Um, greater time for the county to actually implement that budget and, and move forward. So if there's a new initiative that even if it comes up and gets approved by the delegation and it's really important to you, um, you know, it gets approved, whether it's February or March, then you start to implement it. You've already lost three months of the year, you know, where you can't potentially get that implemented as quickly as you may like. So uh, one thing might still be to ask the administration to start their work in the latter part of the summer to have things ready first thing in November for the presentation and maybe us convening a little bit earlier and getting started on the budgetary process. Plus, we've already sort of talk, talked about getting a new committee to look at our budgeting process and streamline it some. So. Right, so if I understand I think we correct, can achieve that. correctly from some conversations this morning, you have, you have uh, almost a month time period before you can adopt it after it's delivered to you, but that doesn't mean you can't discuss it, ponder right. it, question, get report backs, whatever you need, get working on it. Yeah. Right. I think Representative Butler is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm sorry I was a little late this morning. Um, was it mentioned that this draft uh, uh, performance audit has been finalized? Um, we have a draft in front of us. Has that been approved as a... We, we, have, we have provided a final version, but... Um, is it different from this draft? I don't believe so. Uh, let me see which I, one you I, I get these yeah, are recommendations. This is, this is, I'm sorry, this one is the, yeah. they are final. Oh, this yeah. is final. That's oh, final report, yeah. That's the final, this yeah. is their yes. summary. Yes, yes. yes. We, we have provided a final version of the report, um, dated April 4th, I believe. And is it significantly different? Uh, no. There are minor uh, word editing, but there's no changes in the recommendations. So. Follow up? Thank you. Uh, going back to the uh, bookkeeping office again, um, are, there are there qualifications for finance manager, controller, bookkeeper um, that are defined in such a way as to differentiate uh, the two, and are there education requirements that are part of it, or is it just um, the duties and the qualifications of each um, position that uh, need to be understood? Um, there, there are no um, required uh, education certifications background for either of those positions. Um, what you will find, though, is typically the finance manager is going to have a higher level of qualifications than the controller bookkeeper and will be responsible for a broader array of duties including more policy decisions and uh, the higher level of financial functions than you see at the bookkeeper or controller level. But, I mean, you can look across finance directors or controller bookkeeper positions uh, in comparable counties and their requirements are going to vary significantly based upon what they have viewed as as critical, um, but there is a hierarchy where the finance director is going to require greater skill sets than what you would have as a controllable. And one final question, Madam Chair. Um, and in, either in the final report uh, or uh, separately to the administrator, have you provided um, job descriptions for those positions? Um, we have not. We were not asked to, but I would be happy to share example ones if you desire. Thank you. Representative Marsh? Yes, in discussing the positions in the finance department, I'm accustomed to always hearing some sort of comment regarding separation of duties, and I'm wondering if you would like to make some comment regarding that. Well, that's part of the reason why we're uh, suggesting staffing needs to be at three, uh, because when you have only two positions, it's pretty hard to segregate duties because there are going to be times when there's only one person there. So people who are entering uh, changes in the financial system, entering um, uh, pay rates, entering uh, payments, and then they're also processing in the checks and they're issuing the checks. You, you do run into some issues with um, you know, the inability to have effective internal controls. Uh, 
that's always a struggle for a smaller organization because to have um, best in class internal controls, you'd have to have greater staffing that probably isn't worried by the workload. But I think with three, you can get there sufficiently. And that's usually something your auditors look at on an annual basis as part of their, their financial review is, are there any particular concerns that they've seen in terms of that? But I think you could, even though it will be tough with only three, I think you can segregate them enough to be compliant with what you need to do. Thank you. Representative Woodcock. Thank you, Mayor Chair. Um, one question, and I don't know if it's, it's appropriately to you at this point or to the administrator, I'm just going back to the Department head access to accounts, general accounts. Uh, I'm trying to determine if, if it's a computer issue or a policy issue that's currently in place. Why that doesn't? It would seem to me that would be something that would be in place. And I don't know. If, I don't know if I can ask to the administrator or have to go. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm asking you, Madam Chair. It, it would. Be, it would be currently a cost issue. Excuse me. A cost issue. Okay. Um, we, we, we did get a quote last year uh, for nine seats. Currently we have four seats. Um, and uh, for all the department heads to have access, it'd be about $20,000 extra. Um, so we are, you know, we are working our way towards it, you know. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Would, would it be possible to have to have one of the computers in the office that they could go and sit down at and control one of them? They get weekly reports. Just, every, but just for view. Not they they get view. weekly reports every week. They get weekly reports. Um, the the business office here has has access to ACS, so the nursing home has has access. Um, they don't have to go over to our our uh, to our place. Um, Jason gets uh, weekly reports. And anybody else who wants them, um, after every after every check run, each department gets their expenditure of what came out of what budget and how much. Um, so, you know, I mean, just, just you know, if they want access to ACS, yeah, but you know, you you got to fund us twenty thousand dollars. So, um, but we're gonna wait until we get into the cloud to you know to to move everything. And once we get the purchasing order, once we get the um, the the uh, uh, accounts payable module, once we get in the cloud, then we'll move towards that. But it won't be until 2020. That makes sense. Yeah. Representative Coyote? Yeah. Uh, a few things. Um, what I just heard from the uh, administrator is very much different than I've heard from department heads. A department head is telling me that they've had to wait from February to August to get uh, reports. Um, uh, <coughs> So I think there's uh, quite a disconnect there, and um, you know the commissioners might look into that that issue in terms of um, job responsibilities and job descriptions. I was wondering if you um, if you were supplied job descriptions. Yeah, we we, we, we got job descriptions for key okay. positions. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, the copies of the job descriptions um, I have, um, I think, are the latest, but I'm not positive. Um, they're not really dated in, in all cases. But I, I found it very, very odd. Um, if I could read the qualifications for the HR director, uh, requires knowledge of human resources management equivalent to the completion of a bachelor's degree plus five to 10 years with progressive responsibility. Finance director, Re duties require a high school diploma with accounting business office management preparation. Knowledge of computers. Um, would you see that as a satisfactory uh, finance director, finance manager? I would say it's not the, the common uh, background or experience that would be required for a finance director. It would typically be, uh, in most organizations, it would require a, a college degree. And depending upon the size of the organization, some level of prior experience. Whether that's as a, it wouldn't necessarily have to be as a director, but financial experience. Um, when I say degree, uh, historically those have always been required at, at a department head type level for that. But um, you are seeing organizations moving more to the core equivalency. Uh, there's a, a big push for looking at a variety of things. But 
finance is, is a little different in that you do have to have a certain level of skill and training. You can get that in many ways. Uh, historically, it's been through an education process. Lieutenant Butler. Thank you. Um, relative to the annual audit, um, statutorily, um, I don't recall when that is supposed to be completed. Can somebody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 90, days. Yeah. 90 days after the close of the books or at the close of your fiscal year. So then for us, that would be March 30th? Yeah. When we close the books, um, it could be 90 days after uh, March 30th. Um, Right now, there's, there's I think some legislation trying to trying to change that, trying to define you know what what the close of the year is. Um, we taught the auditors they look at it as when they close the books. That's when the year ends. Because we were still you know we still get invoices in February, early March right, that discussion. go back to 18. Right. So, and if I could, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and this year. Uh, was our audit completed 90 days after the close of the book? No, we were just... Well, we just well, we're still working on it. I just... Even after the budget got passed, I still had people coming to me with stuff that had to go back to the 2018 budget. They were legitimate. They had issues with the invoices that companies never sent them. That is our biggest problem because I have to have a manner to get that charge to that budget. So I can't do it after the auditors have completed their work. So I, when I get this, I give it all the information to the auditors so they'll know that I'm putting the stuff into the system. But it's really tough to close the books because of that sort of stuff. So it's usually not till the end of March that I can even hope to have the books closed. Thank you. In regards to the audit and the 90-day requirement, we're hearing two different things. Close a fiscal year and close of books. When I ask the other counties, the close of the fiscal year is when the clock starts to tick. Now I'm hearing it's the close of the books. What is the answer? I'm not hearing a clear answer on that. There is legislation in to change to 120 days, 120 days. The committee that heard the bill two years ago, which was to change to 120 days, it failed because they said 120 days is too long, that 90 days is, per, is a, an amount that works for everybody across the, across the board. So what is the answer? Close the fiscal year or close the books? I would say that's a legal question that I can't, I'm not competent to tell you how to interpret your statute, um, and nor will I try, so. Um, <laughs> well, maybe but, we can let Representative Abelani say things he knows. Um, but, but I think um, it, it, whichever determination is, is the final one you get, it is important to clearly know what's the target we're trying to hit. Um, uh, you will have uh, invoices and stuff that come in late. And, the issue is how you set your financial policies up to address those. So if you are encumbering funds through purchase orders and other things, uh, most organizations will have a deadline to say if the invoice is not received by uh, January 30th, then it doesn't get paid out of the prior year, it gets paid out of the new year. And that way you can, they, most departments will set a firm deadline so that they can close their books and not be held based upon other invoices that will come in. And then what happens for the department is, they work with their vendors to make sure they get their invoices. Otherwise, they have to pay for it out of their next year's allocation. So there are things like that you can do to um, move your uh, end of year closure up. You just have to say, you have to change the approach you've had in the past to financial practices. If you are trying to put every payment that was incurred in 2018 and pay it out of 2018, then you are going to have a much longer time period before you can close your, your books. That's absolutely correct. Um, but you could change it to say, after this date, it no longer gets posted to 2018, it gets posted to your current year's budget. Um, and, and that way you, you can uh, get to a deadline so you could start your audit sooner. Is that about it? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Representative Nelson? Yes, yeah, just going right along with that. Um, what's, why not close the books, say, the 10th of the month? 
close it there. You're going to be off the first month. But when you think eventually things catch up, maybe messed up the first year to say, we're going to close the books on the 10th of month for monthly statements. And whatever numbers are there, that's the, the numbers you use for that month. And then eventually, you'll be off, it'll catch up, and every 10th of the month, you'll have data. Because we usually have to wait six weeks, four weeks, six weeks, before we get the quarterly, I should say, quarterly reports. Um, I, I, I guess maybe I don't know enough about why it takes that long to do that. I mean, the expenditure, you know, your monthly expenditures, whatever's been processed through that last run in the month is what's going to show up in that monthly total. And I think I'm saying the knot is down there. I think that's their process. So I, I don't think you have to set a date for it because it's the last check run of the month, that, that's the last expenditure that's going to get posted to that month. And then it's a match. So you actually have to, and then you're going to do the reconciliation after you get your statements from the bank. Um, so I'm assuming that's exactly what I'm talking about. Every month it should be done two days after the books are closed for that month, but we seem to take a long time to get that data for that month. I can't believe they just can't send it out the next day, one or two days. This is your monthly data and start a process to get it out sooner. You, you should be able to get a report very quickly after a month end closure of all the revenues and expenditures that were posted for the prior month. Anything that's, that's going to be in the system and that's typically how it's done based on both updates. Thank you. Representative Cordelli? I think Representative Marshall. No. Um, it, I wanted to get into some other areas if you wanted to continue on this discussion. I just wanted to make a point on this discussion. Thank you for yielding to me. Um, I looked up Senate Bill 101 after the discussion in the Executive Committee. Current statute is 90 days after the close of the fiscal year. That's quite clear in statute. Uh, Senate Bill 101 quite clearly changes it to 120 days after the close of the books. Representative Cordell. Um, thank you. Um, wanted to get into a, a couple of um, other areas. Um, uh, IT we discussed um, briefly, and you discussed in your report, um, um, and the possibility of in-house versus contracted services. Um, I guess one of my concerns is that there is that. Um, we have had an IT committee in um, the county that was made of department um, representatives, plus I was a representative from the delegation. Um, that ended and has not been reactivated for some reason. Um, but we had uh, the administrator from uh, Brewster Academy uh, come in and suggest an in-house um, and had um, uh, estimates um, for the price tag of such a person being quite a bit lower. Right now, we have a person who comes in once a week, basically, and I think more is more of a technician. Um, I might be wrong, but I, I believe it is my impression that they do not get involved with uh, software planning. Um, uh, we've had discussions about ACS. The administrator has uh, mentioned on several occasions that we don't know if we're going to stay with that system. I would think that our consultant would have be part of that discussion as to um, uh, a recommendation in that regard, um, and maybe others as well. Um, uh, in terms of department head access, um, to the ACS system. Um, we've been talking about that since I've been on the delegation, which is seven years. Um, this is the first time I have heard about uh, needing a price quote for the additional seats. Um, it's never been presented in a budget to us, and it has always been explained to us that while they get timely reports, so it's not needed, um, there is in the budget um, the move to the cloud, so to speak, to get away from a hosted uh, here uh, scenario to them hosting it, um, as well as moving toward purchasing system um, and accounts payable, as, as was mentioned. 
But I, I think, wouldn't you say that that requires a great deal of planning and preparation and that if we have an IT consultant, um, that they should be involved in the planning of that move? Uh, so, IT in general, the, the reason we've suggested to stay with the contracting is uh, if you were to try to bring in house everything that you would likely need for IT, you probably couldn't accomplish it easily with one individual. To get somebody who has software background, the strategic planning on IT usage, as well as being able to do the, um, the infrastructure component, the servers and the backbones, all of that is, is not something you can easily get in one individual anymore. They're, they're very specialized. Um, so yes, yeah, so, uh, there is a whole area of IT work that is done upon uh, identifying business requirements. It's where they look at your processes, they document what you need in a system, they help you select the right system, uh, but that's not cheap and it doesn't do much towards uh, your day to day. Now, people who can do basic uh, desktop support, those type of things, can often, you might get the right person who could also help with the business requirements. You would still need, I think, uh, a significant amount of contracted services in order to meet the hardware uh, and backbone infrastructure sort of components. That's why we felt uh, the existing approach is probably best. And um, with time put into it, usually staff are capable of uh, identifying the functionalities of the systems that they need. So finance directors and HR directors um, um, can develop those functionalities, look at the other systems, and, and make a good selection there. But um, no, there's no, there's no doubt you could elevate your approach to IT, uh, but it would, it would take an investment of resources to do that. I don't think you could take the existing budget and bring somebody in-house and reduce that enough to not have a cost increase if you wanted to do that. Uh, IT is becoming more complex. <coughs> Going to the cloud is great because you, you don't have to worry about maintaining the stuff. Um, I think all the modules you're talking about adding, whether it's with ACS or you go with something else, uh, procurement and payables, all those things make the system a lot more functional, a lot more automated, um, and uh, reduces staff time. So I think those are all good things to be looking at. So, you know, I, I need to correct Representative Crudelli. He's totally wrong. Um, <laughs> we, our IT consultant is here three days a week. Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, um, and he also has 20, we, we have him for 24 hour access on our dispatch center and in the nursing home. So if anything goes down, uh, the three and at 3 o'clock in the morning in dispatch, John is on it. Um, so he's not here one day a week, and it's not a technician, it's the owner of the company. Um, and I consult with him on every IT item that, that, that I plan on doing. Um, I utilize John as he was a, a, like a regular department head. So now I just want to set that record straight. That is, he's here more than one day a week and it's not a technician. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's actually the clarification for Representative Marsh, I'm not sure I'm sure what you said correctly, Bill. Um, the, not the upcoming possible statute change, but the current statute change in 90 days Current statute is 90 days. 90 days after the end of the fiscal, fiscal year, year, which okay. I think everybody agrees is impossible to meet. But that's what the current okay. statute is. The 120 was proposed at this point. But right now we're working with 90. Not only 90, but it's 90 after the fiscal that's year. I mean, that's the close of the books is in the new statute. It's right. not in the old. Okay. Okay. Representative Cordelli, did you have a follow-up? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, that's okay. I'll leave that. But um, if it's okay to move to another area. Well, I, I want to address one more follow-up. Um, so when our auditors were here last time giving their presentation and that question was asked, when do you consider the close of the fiscal year? And they said, when they close the books. So that's, and, and we got our auditors for everything that's, that, um, that we don't truly or fully understand. We get with them to make sure that this is the way they want us to do it and it's the right way. So we always consult with our auditors. Um, and they interpret the law as the fiscal year is when they close the book. So, can I respond to that, please? I agree with the administrator that that is the correct way of doing it. However, it is not the way the current statute reads, and I support Senate Bill 101. Thank you. Representative Babalani. 
close the, the end of the fiscal year is the end of the fiscal year. When you close your books, something totally different. So we can't mix the two together. Right. End of the year is December 31st at midnight. <clears throat> That's your end of your fiscal year as we see it now. I agree with that. So, but the end of closing the books could be January 15th. They close businesses close their books for the following. So we can make the IRS deadline. Other people might be February. Some people might be March. We just can't mix the two, the two together. So it's the end of the fiscal year is the fiscal year. Close the books is to something totally different. I agree with that. Representative Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would hope that the commissioners uh, and the administrator would work with uh, the auditors to understand this uh, closing of the books piece a little clearer. Because if it is possible to define the uh, closing of the books at the end of January uh, of the following year um, by policy so that anything else beyond that goes into the uh, next fiscal year so that we could have a close of the fiscal year in a way that is definitive, um, that might be very useful for all of us. Um, and even though fiscal year ending and closing of the books is different, if the new law says it's got to be done 120 days after the close of the books, it still would mean that we would want to have some definitive um, numbers to work with before October of the following year, we need to have something that defines it more clearly. Representative Como. The other component is the statute also says that the annual report has to be filed six months after the close of the fiscal year, which includes the management letter from the auditors. So that also is not happening, didn't happen last year on time. So that, that also, I believe, is changed in SB 101 also, but it have to be changed. Representative Bucco. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, um, agree with Representative Butler. What the auditor has in her timeline here is um, 2018, when the books are closed to be determined. I think we need to pin it down a little more than that. Representative Cordati. Um, if I could take a look at the uh, HR section, the HR sure. issues, we haven't gotten to that yet. Um, Excuse me, one, there, I think there might be some questions on this before, okay. before you turn the page. Um, Representative Woodcock, can I see Thank you, just a question for the administrator, if I may. Um, so as regards the uh, purchases, the bids, are. Uh, that we send out, uh, is there a way, or do we currently put something on those that would say that at the end of the 30 days past whatever date, that the invoice will not be accepted or go into the next fiscal year so that every vendor knows that? I mean, do, do you do that currently as process, or I mean, so the department chair is not running for 90 days trying to catch up with folks that sell all this money? And would that help at all, or that just, no? I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I don't, um, the, the ones that we normally see all the time are electric bills, you know, propane right. bills, agency staffing. Sometimes, you know, a couple of invoices will be missed um, through email, because they submit it through email. Yeah. Um, um, what? And, oh, m uh, jail inmate medical. Um, that's three, four months behind. You know, hospitals are very... Okay. Slow sending out, you know, a bill sometimes. Um, so I, I, I think working together, though, I think um, you know we can come up with something. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative okay. March. Yes, I uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I truly appreciate Representative Butler's comment and Republican's response to that. And I would like to ask Representative Butler if he would like to make a motion that we request of the commissioners to develop a policy regarding the closing of the books and encumbering the funds. Uh, prior to the next quarter. Um, thank you for the, can, can I respond, Madam Chair? Thank you. Um, I would prefer to not have a motion, um, but uh, to get some assent that the commissioners will look at the issue of creating a closing date for the books. I believe that is something that we could certainly look at and work on because I have a business and my business ends December 31st at midnight. 
and everything goes on to the next year. And the first year would be out of whack, but if you go on, um, it, it fits out. So I think that makes sense that we might choose a date. Clear on the side. Would you like to turn the page? Thank you. Um, resources area. Uh, several uh, things I wanted to, to ask about. Uh, uh, one is, uh, I think, on page nine um, of the report, the buyback programs. Um, you've got cautions about buyback, um, or uh, cautions in terms of um, standard operating procedures. Um, in other uh, local governments, and uh, we evidently have a, a buyback policy right. for non-salaried, uh, non-union uh, employees. And I just wondered if you could touch on that. So, the, right, this is the one where this was a specific issue you asked us to look at in the prior audit, um, and. You know, we said, you know, you shouldn't implement new programs for, for buying back uh, on UC time, but we'll, if you desire to implement one, you should uh, have a formal policy on what it was going to be. So at that point, I think there were, as I recall, there were some concerns about some inconsistencies in how it was done. Um, but you do have it in some of your collective bargaining agreements, so that's there. Um, you know, so that's not going to change unless you negotiate it up. Um, for non-union employees, it's handled on a case-by-case -case basis, as I understand. Um, in that case, we'd still suggest having a formal policy on what your, your practice is to ensure that you're consistent in terms of um, treating people fairly and consistent, you know, based upon paying for unused time. So that, that really isn't something we dealt with in the report other than give you an update on where you were at on, on that level of implementation. Um, but you would recommend it if the commissioners want to continue a non-union buyback program, that there be a policy established and a procedure for that in terms of who approves the buyback. Because so I would think that, you know, with yeah. sometimes some significant dollar amounts that the commissioners would want some information about the buyback program. Right, so it would just be a formal policy on what's counted, what can be purchased back, what rate is used, who, who's approving it, you know, who validates it, et cetera. Just so, just so that you're consistent. It's, it, it's less a right or wrong at this point. It's a let's be consistent in how we're doing it moving forward. Because for a long-term employee, that can be a, a fairly significant uh, fiscal impact for organizations that have these programs. And so you want to at least make sure you're, you're being consistent in how you administer. Also, um, in relation to HR um, policies, um, you talked about um, exit interviews both in 2014 and in this audit and uh, the importance of those and um, that they were not consistently being done. Um, uh, I, I also view them very important because uh, we've had quite a bit of staff turnover here, so I think it's even more important that exit interviews are being done. Um, but, you know, maybe we can get uh, administration um, view of this also because uh, in the uh, 2017 update that the administrator prepared uh, on performance audit items, um, he indicated that exit interviews were an old way of getting information. So, you know, maybe we could hear from, from uh, you as well as the administrator in that regard. Uh, I'll, I'll give you my perspective. Is um so I think that they have been implemented in some cases. They haven't been done consistently. Uh, I think that if you're going to do them, do them or attempt to do them for every employee that departs so you get the information and can identify are people leaving because of salary issues, benefit issues, supervision issues, workplace culture. It at least gives the commissioner some information. Well, so they have to be done. Then that information needs to be shared with the policymakers. In this case, the first line would be the commissioners to say, is there something we need to do um, in response to this? Or is this just normal turnover? So there are positions in the nursing home that are going to be high turnover. That's routine in many organizations. There are other types of positions that are high turnover. Um, I come in as an entry level. I want to progress up. If I can't do it here, I move to another organization. There's nothing wrong with that sort of turnover. 
Uh, but if they're leaving for other reasons and you identify that, you then have a, a, a policy decision you can make. Do we address our salary? Do we address our benefits? Do we um, have a need to better train our supervisors? Um, things that you can do to ensure it's a, uh, the best workplace you can have. And you may find no issues with that. And there are other ways you can get that information. You can do it through employee climate <coughs> surveys. You can do it through a host of other things. Uh, but this is one way to at least uh, attempt to get that information. Okay, uh, Representative Woodcock. If, if I may, you done with the question? Uh, if I could just follow up on the exit interviews. Fine, go ahead. Um, my, from my background, um, I'm used to uh, exit interviews and also, and also an exit interview checklist, which might also tie back to the HR director need. Um, but I would think a, a checklist when an employee leaves is very um, important. I know we always used to, you know, have to check off that we got back the ID card and so forth. When um, uh, employees are provided access to, let's say, um, a county laptop or a county cell phone, do we shouldn't there be some sort of check that we are uh, getting um, all the uh, employee provided items returned to the county? that need to be returned. Absolutely, and I, I have to be honest, I don't know if that's occurring or not. It could be happening at the department level, uh, and I'd ask your, your, your staff to respond. Uh, I, I, from our review, I have no indication that that's not happening. It's not happening at the director, HR director level because there hasn't been one, um, where it's sometimes that position is used as a central point to make sure that all those things are done before the final check is issued. And, separation, but you could do it at the department level. Many organizations, the department has to ensure that they get back their uh, issued equipment, IDs, whatever it might be. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. To follow up, I made a representative of Coyale's questioning on, on the extent to use. Uh, in your experience, is that typically done by a human resource director or is that typically done by an administrator in this type of an organization? It, it can be done by, it's typically done by an HR professional, um, but it, it could be done by other individuals. So. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any further questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, HR related area um, and might involve both policy and staffing. Um, uh, should there be a procedure, a policy for um, both hiring as well as any promotions or increases in compensation? Um, should there be a, a defined uh, procedure for um, promotions, hiring, etc.? I, I would think that that would all be part of um, an HR function? Well, absolutely, and I believe there is a hiring policy that was developed and adopted, and I'm sure staff will correct me if I'm misspoke here, but I think because that's one of the things we noted uh, had been done since our last, uh, so yes, I mean, you should have procedures for how you fill positions, whether it's a promotional, new hire, covers things such as the process you're going to go through, how you're going to establish um, initial salary and benefits and those types of things, again, just for consistency. But I'm not sure that I'm aware of anything where you're not in compliance with that now. But promotions also, um, sh there should be a policy for approval of promotions, uh, not just having a department head handing out promotions um, because they run a reward uh, employee. Yeah, I mean, there's typically, there has to be a vacancy there for somebody to be promoted, but otherwise it's, if you're reclassifying a position, there's usually a different process, because you're changing it based upon the duties that are performed. Uh, I don't view that as a promotion. A promotion is usually something that is uh, more competitive, or there's a vacancy that you've applied for. Uh, if you're changing it based upon a change in job duties, I usually refer to that as a, like a reclassification of the mm -hmm. position. Um, the incumbent is moved to a new position because the duties are different. So, but yes. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, Representative Woodcock. Yes, Madam Chair, this is also No, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
Um, just a quick, if we're, done, if we're done with the actual questioning of the report, then and I don't want to shut that off, it's, that's not my point. Um, I'd like to know what our next steps are going to be as regards the integration of the detailed report recommendations, this, the commission, the delegation, and the uh, administrator. What, what is the process? So it just doesn't get a report and we have another report. But I don't want to ask that until you've done, I don't want to interrupt this. That's okay. Um, I think uh, then uh, Mr. Robichaud, perhaps you'd like to respond. So, so I use that as, as, as my roadmap, as I did the, uh, uh, the uh, 2014 audit. You know, I went down through the 2014 audit, identified things that, that needed to be implemented right away, or, you know, or as time, or as time uh, went on. Um, this, I, I will do the same. I mean, we're already identifying the two, uh, you know, the two most important issues, is the administrative assistant and the HR director, which we're actively filling at this time. Um, and then I'll take put everything else out that, that, that Alan's put together. We're going to continue our finance policies. We're going to continue with you know, other policies. Um, we've been working on a 2019 um, employee handbook. We started that last summer, but with the, you know, with the budget and then with the lack of help, uh, we are talking about reestablishing that to finish it up before the end of this year is done. So we'll have an updated uh, employee handbook with all our policies. Um, we currently do uh, exit checklists. We have a, ch a checklist that you know gets back any keys, any any property that belongs to the county, and we also have a hire checklist. We go through our checklist as we go through the hiring process, um, and we do have a hiring policy. Which does talk about you know, how that, we hire. That's part of too is that with the HR director they talk about updating those policies. So I'm sure those are going to address by the commission. Um, follow up to that now. <coughs> yes, follow up follow to, up. to you, I guess, and put this into the commission. Mm -hmm. um, is there going to be a timetable established when we hear back on the progress on the, these recommendations? I mean, is the commission accepting these recommendations as valid? And if, there, if they are, when it's going to be monthly, bi-monthly, or just, do we have a sequence so we know, so we aren't waiting until the next audit? <coughs> I'm asking you the chair. Uh, uh, I think, and the finance committee met this morning and we, we started to look at some of the issues in, in oversight, and I think that and what we heard today, that we will be um, meeting with the commissioners and we'll be looking at some of these issues and what, what is a reasonable time frame to, to move. Because um, some of these things do come under our oversight, but a lot of them are the management, which is the commissioners. And I'm sure we will all be looking at these and, with the administration and be trying to work out how this is going to go. I think, I agree with you, I believe they need to be there need to be some goals and things. This can't all happen in 24 hours, but we need to set our goals and how they're going to happen. Um, Go on. Yes, we have um, Representative Cordelli. Thank you. I, I'd like to follow up on that in that I, I think that, that um, Representative Woodcock raised a very significant point. Um, and uh, you know, I'd be interested in the uh, uh, commissioner's viewpoint on that. Um, and hopefully that they would, at each of their meetings, be talking about this. Because very often, um, unfortunately, and um, I think your reports both in 14 and 18 have talked about the efficiency and effectiveness of the commissioner's meetings um, and talking about priorities and action items and you know where we stand with certain things that, that seems to be missing in, in some cases at the commissioner meetings. And so I would just like to hear from the, maybe the chair of the commissioners um, about their view of this and how the follow-up is going to work. Well, as of July 1st, that's our goal for hiring any job director. A goal. Um, I believe that before June 1st, we will have an administrative assistant. That's a goal. Um, I will believe it will be on 
on the agenda to talk about end of year fiscal deadline, ending, whatever, but we need to consult with the auditors on that. And I know you all have your opinions, but we do have to work with the auditors. And I think we'll have to listen to their opinions on that also. The other recommendations, they look to me to be a, an ongoing process. If there aren't too many others, I think that we can say, okay, we will do it by this date. I think they're a work in progress. We have updated the hiring policy just two weeks ago or a week ago. We are updating the HR director, uh, or we are looking at the HR director um, job description. So we, and we look at policies. We've been updating policies almost on a weekly basis. That's why some of our meetings run until 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But, um, you know, when I came here, as when I was first elected, I wanted everything done the first month. And I have learned patience and tolerance, and also I have been told by every member of the delegation and the commission that government works slowly for a reason. And I am coming to believe that that is true. I still want it all done yesterday, um, but we, we're making progress, as Alan has explained. What I have seen in the past two years has been incredible improvements in, in different departments. The past four years, when I that was one of the reasons I ran, because things were a mess, and uh, I, I think that mess has been a great deal of it, at least 80, 85 percent cleaned up, straightened up. But as you solve some problems, more come to the surface, and, and we are, I believe, working on them. If I can come up with a timeline, um, I will present it to the commissioners within two weeks uh, for some of these other items that we may have a, a definite date for we can put on there. I hope that answered your question. Senator Woodcock. This is probably my final comment on this. People are happy with that. I don't want to lose sight of the last comment on page nine, and that is that the the uh, county has made great strides in putting implementing, implementing the recommendations from the last audit since the hire of the administrator in 2015. I think that's that's critical a piece. We're all questioning pieces of the recommendation, but I don't think it should sound like nothing's been accomplished and moving in a negative way. I think it's moving in a positive way. I'm trying to question what's in the audit, that's all. I don't want to lose sight of that fact that they've made great strides. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Nelson? No. Mr. Rosset? Uh, Representative Bucco? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as far as the three positions in the finance office, I've, I just heard twice that we're, we're looking to hire the administrative assistant. Uh, the other two positions, uh, finance manager and controller, are those staffed already? Well, I guess I'm ignorant that I don't know who does what over there. Cheryl's shows a bookkeeper, and Kathy's our finance director. Thank you. Okay, Representative Nerf. Thank you. Just a quick comment that's a follow up on this discussion of um, making sure we don't lose sight of what needs to be done, forget about it, and shelve it that uh, Representative Brookhouse brought up. Could we at least make an agreement that perhaps by September we would have from the commissioners sort of a side-by-side -side of here's the key recommendation, this is what we've done. In other words, it's either completed or it is in process or here's the target date. Um, it's sort of a, a means of setting not so much a deadline as a, a, a continual looking to make sure we're meeting these requirements uh, in a timely fashion and not getting to two years from now and saying, oh gosh, we never really did that. That, you know, sort of in, in writing, which would be helpful, because you said a whole bunch of things, but, you know, we'll all forget about tomorrow, in writing, and we would sit down and discuss that at one of our meetings and say, okay, are we making sufficient progress? And I think a third column would be, what are the barriers you're seeing that maybe make it difficult to achieve it? In other words, here's a goal, we'd love to, but here's a barrier that we see, either funding or personnel or something. 
Would that be something that we could all agree on to make sure we don't lose momentum? And I mean that whole delegation act. Well, that's what I was kind of thinking about in the timeline in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but if you want to wait till September to do that, that's probably fine. Well, Never follow, against procrastination. I mean, follow follow up. Earlier would be nicer, though. I mean, at least a relatively solid September to kind of look at the whole big picture. And maybe at our next meeting, we should have a preliminary. I mean, I think each, each time we get together, we said, say, we should spend 10 minutes saying, Here's what we've achieved on trying to reach a uh, satisfactory re resolution of these deficiencies. Well, I can do that. We can do that. The commissioners can do that. The, the finance office and different things. But some of these are dependent upon the delegation. Mm -hmm. uh, what? The delegation. Right. They're well, dependent that's what we need to know. upon. That's oh, right. So, you know, for example, if we. Um, the Human Resource Information System, uh, the commissioners would like to have done that, I believe, three, four years ago, but the money was never appropriated to do that. So that's something that's going to be, you know, it'll be next April before we can work on that, or we can finalize appropriation for the money for something like that. So. Just for well, that's that my idea for the third column. We would say, this is the barrier. The barrier is the delegation needs to act. If we get that feedback, then we can actually make sure we keep making progress and not lose it. Mm -hmm. We have, obviously have to work together. Yep. We will be working together. Representative Cordelli. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I do believe, following on uh, to your comments, uh, uh, there are important items laid out in here that should be priorities. There are, some of them correspond to things that we did put in the budget. And I would like a plan for that. There seem to be um, uh, some inconsistencies in terms of, you know, I've heard at recent commissioner meetings, um, they now want to do an inventory system. We just heard the chair talking about an H, uh, human resources system. You know, I would think we want to have a human resources director to help us select a human resources system. Um, uh, we heard about an inventory system. I would think that, and putting in place, um, charging someone in uh, the nursing home with coming up with a plan with central purchasing. But we're also talking about a, an, a purchasing system integrated with our general ledger. Shouldn't you know there be some plan for what we're doing? I would think you know we have to establish priorities and a plan. So I would like to see priorities and a plan. That would be my goal. Mr. Rupshaw. Um I think this is um, a little going a little too far. I think the, the, I think the, the board of commissioners can can make up their own mind what they want to do. Um, we have the operation, so um, I, I, I think um, that, that they can come up with some sort of plan um, of what they want to do. That would be very nice. I would like to see that. Well, I don't know if they're going to share it with you, but I know they're well, going to plan. Well, maybe they should, share, maybe they should <laughs> share it with the public. They are elected oh, by the tax. Okay, okay. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I think we have a path forward. Yes. And I think we can um, because it is getting late. And, and very quickly, I'll just. Thank you. I, I have one last question. Okay. You have one last question? Yeah. One last question. Nothing, nothing to do with any of this. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> do you do like a. Would you come in and do a department performance review? Like, say, we wanted to look at the nursing home, its structure, if there were any redundancies in billing, collecting, um, staffing. Um, inadequacy, stuff like that. Would you would you come in and do a? The majority of our work are departmental audits. Um, so whether that's a finance department, an HR, or a nursing home, sheriff's department, public work. Yes, we have staff who specialize in those areas who do department specific. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I would just like to thank uh, Alan yes. and Matrix. Uh, for their work both uh, this year and back uh, five years ago as well. It's, uh, 
I think, very helpful uh, to me, certainly, and I hope for everyone. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you. I was thank you. Say the same. Thank you for thank coming you. all Nothing. this way. Oh, my bad. Thank you. Thank you. Right to us. Uh, yes. Let's just know, before he sits down, can you tell us where the photo was taken from? Can you tell us where the photo was taken from? Can I tell you where it was taken from? No. But I know it's Chuck Conner. That's only half the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do very brief. I can't read the sign. I'm trying to carry it. Yes, still in session. The next item on the agenda is just to, to say what we did at the um, finance committee meeting this morning. Uh, we are looking at, at more efficient ways, that more understandable ways of reviewing, doing our, our uh, oversight, especially of monitoring the budget. And one of the things we are talking about doing, in addition to not making major changes and how it's currently done, but we want a way to be able to track in, within the budget how the over expenses, what the impact is on each line only. So we looked at and talked about some different ways of, of viewing the report so that we can see. Right now, when, when a, an item is transferred, where it is taken from, we, we can't always see that, and the department has not always know that. So what we are looking at is adding, as doing the transfers to the budget, and actually, Representative Marsh can probably explain better, um, it's, it's how we did it at the hospital, and we're looking at doing that so we can track that. What we decided to do was to adopt Kathy's suggestion to allow the line item transfers to give us an updated budget total, provided she also provided us a report comparing the uh, uh, approved budget with the updated budget. And also we're going to include one of our reports that we can view to compare it to where that was that quarter the previous year so that we can also see the differences in our budget to have a clearer look at what's happening. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, there would be uh, an adopted year budget column and then there would be an adjusted year column. Yes, she stated that that was a report that she could deliver. To us. Okay. And it, it allows us to see and to track rather than when you do, when you transfer and post here and then post over here, it kind of you can't see where it's going. But, but I want to make clear that it's a separate report. It's a separate report, a separate report. that we will be able to look at. Um, if, if I could uh, mention also that several years ago, um, we had gotten a very nice end of the year report um, that did show um, uh, very clearly where the transfers went. Um, and I'd be glad to send that uh, around to, to everybody, because uh, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to or, or something else. But I'll, well, we're I will, trying to do it as efficiently as possible. Right. I will mail you what we had gotten, um, I think it was two years ago. I, I think a comparison of the adopted budget to the uh, adjusted budget would give us precisely that information. Whether, I don't know if it's the same document. Right. I'll send it around for yeah, your... We can compare it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Butler. Thank you. Um, it, it may be just my inability to recall uh, details, but um, the executive committee is different from the finance committee. It is the finance committee according to the, right. yeah, according to the RSA. So the executive committee and the finance committee are the same and you're focusing, the finance committee is focusing just on, on financial issues? Or is the executive? No, that, that's what we did this morning. Okay. We met to look at that issue. And I think that with what we've all heard now, we probably will meet again because we want to work with the commissioners and, and what's going to be happening. Thank so you. I'm sure we'll be meeting again. So thank you. Um, and I have to really thank our people from the Carroll County Coalition for Public Health who've been sitting through this morning. I'm sure it's been very educational. <laughs> 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 but I, I apologize for how long it is going, so we would be happy to hear from you this morning. All right. Um, so I've got some you want to stand, if you would stand over here, we'd appreciate it because yeah. the public yeah. view is being videotaped from this side. All right, 
Thanks. So uh, I just want to say a quick thank you to uh, Madam Chair and the uh, delegation members for giving us a few minutes. Uh, my name is Caleb Gilbert. I'm the Public Health Advisory Council Coordinator, and I'm with the uh, Carroll County Coalition for Public Health. Um, just give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves. I'll start with Jeff over here. I'm Jeff Jones. I'm the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for Carroll County. And Jennifer, if you want to introduce yourself as you um, Jennifer Selfridge, Substance Use Prevention. And then, uh, yeah. Catalina Hirsch, Continuum of Care Facilitator for Substance Use Services in Carroll County. Right. So I'm sure a number of you are familiar with, uh, with the coalition. Um, so we just kind of wanted to just take a quick chance in a few moments to kind of talk about the work we do in the county um, and also, of course, invite um, participation and involvement in many of the initiatives that we're involved in. Um, so, Carroll County Coalition for Public Health is an initiative of Grand United Way. Uh, we're funded by um, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services um, to be the uh, regional public health network for Carroll County. Um, so, we serve the entire county and we're concerned about the health and the population, uh, health of the population of all the communities within Carroll County. Um, the work we do is um, guided by the Community Health Improvement Plan. Um, you'll see in your folders um, on the right hand side. There's a, a little, um, just a quick one-pager uh, highlighting our community health improvement priorities. Um, this five-year plan was developed with, uh, by looking at data, working with our partners, um, including both hospitals, um, Huggins and Memorial, um, to really and input from our partners who are involved in our work um, and, and the public as well to, to create um, a community health improvement plan that focuses on, on health priorities. The current uh, plan runs until uh, 2020, so next year we'll be re redoing this again. What's nice is it, it uh, lines up with the hospital's community health um, needs assessments, so we can really use the data and uh, the input that's collected um, by those community health needs assessments to make sure that we're kind of aligning and focusing on the priorities um, that both of the hospitals are. Um, it just helps to streamline and align efforts. Um, so there are, um, and, and the community health improvement plan runs for five years. Um, so within the community health improvement plan, um, there are six priorities, um, three of which are funded by DHHS. Um, and I'll just walk through those real quick and talk about uh, what the priorities are and some of the um, just quick highlights. Um, I guess real quick before we get into it, you'll also notice in your folder in the middle, not in the pocket, there's a, uh, there's a little um, flyer. And that's for an upcoming community event. It'd be great to see um, to have involvement from the folks here. It um, takes place May 22nd at Kenna High School. It's a, a screening of the film Resilience, which focuses on um, early childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and uh, the brain biology of toxic stress. So I just kind of wanted to uh, say that we probably saw it when you opened up your folder that that was there. Um, so anyway, back into the uh, CHIP priorities. Uh, the first DHHS funded priority is uh, substance misuse prevention. Um, First one I'm going to discuss, and uh, so really this this priority works is about partnership across all sectors um, to educate, uh, build skills, and craft, uh, craft policies that support uh, substance use prevention. And just a couple of uh, recent highlights of some of the work that's come out of that uh, particular priority. Uh, there was the uh, uh, through youth empowerment. There was the uh, North Country Youth Leadership Summit that was hosted at Kennedy uh, High School in January. You may have seen that written up in the Conway Daily Sun. It was a, a pretty uh, uh, successful event. Um, and, uh, Jennifer did a lot of work coordinating that um, and, getting, and also really working to get uh, involved from all the schools in the county, um, uh, middle school and high school. And another uh, just quick highlight would be drug, uh, drug take back day efforts in the county. Those have been increasing um, and this there was one held actually just this past Saturday, April 27th, um, where the county collected uh, roughly 692, pill, uh, 692 pounds of unused medications and we had a uh, um, participation from the all the law enforcement agencies in the county, which is great. Um, and that's definitely something that issue that's grown over time. The next uh, initiative is um, Continuum of Care, um, which is referred to on your sheet as access to comprehensive behavioral health services. Um, so this Continuum of Care um, initiative um, increased, uh, works to increase awareness of, and access, uh, uh, awareness of and access to substance, di um, excuse me, substance use disorder treatment um, services across the county, also works to build capacity and expand delivery of services and prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery uh, from and for substance use disorder. Um, so there's a, 
uh, bi-monthly meeting that's um, uh, entitled the uh, Carroll County Responds uh, to SUD, um, and this brings together stakeholders to, to work on uh, all issues related to substance use disorders. Um, and I know we have some delegation members here who uh, participate in that somewhat regularly. Um, Representative Marsh, uh, I've seen him there a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this group also works to help local organizations apply for funding uh, through the um, IDN Region 7. Um, and also works with young adults to promote uh, um, physical and mental health and prevent uh, alcohol and substance um, misuse. And also uh, works on suicide prevention. The next and last funded um, uh, priority is a public health emergency preparedness. And just a quick uh, synopsis of some of the highlights, the things that uh, the FEP, if you will, uh, works on. Um, um, holds uh, regular Narcan events, um, which uh, distributes Narcan um, to the public. Um, and these events are held in Tamworth at the um, Tri-Cat building. Um, that, those happen monthly and um, also in Ossipi and Conway quarterly uh, through some of our uh, recovery partners. And, um, and um, also C2PH, which is sort of the abbreviation for the Carroll County Coalition of Public Health, um, also manages the um, yearly school-based flu clinics. Um, so that takes place um, every October. And uh, public health emergency preparedness is also leading the uh, state response to hepatitis A um, in the county as well. Um, and um, lastly, uh, the public health emergency preparedness um, directs the Carroll County, Carroll County Citizen Corps, which is made up of more than 65 uh, members, and these are volunteers, um, and also works with town EMDs and first responders. And then just real quick, um, so to finish up, there are three other priorities that you'll notice on the on the one page that one page there. Um, those are aging with connection and purpose. And this uh, this initiative, we work with local partners to align efforts um, um, among uh, service providers to address all issues related to um, aging in the county. Um, also, work to increase the awareness and importance of uh, advanced care planning. Um, and those are things like um, advanced care directives. And just some quick highlights from the efforts of that group. There's recently been a Mount Washington Valley age-friendly community initiative that's developed and with 11 communities up in the Mount Washington Valley, and that's through AARP, and that's to uh, really look at how do we make our communities uh, friendly for all ages, particularly for the aging population. Um, and that kind of spurred out the partners that are involved in this initiative. And um, also work that's been done on Healthcare Decisions Day, um, which is really to promote advanced care planning and advanced care directives. Chronic disease is another initiative, um, and we work with partners um, to increase access to healthy activities in, in the county. So we work with uh, Let's Go, which is out of Memorial. They focus on uh, physical activity um, and healthy eating habits. Um, we also um, coordinate efforts with providers that treat chronic diseases. We help coordinate uh, Memorial's. Um, we help to coordinate Memorial's health. Uh, um, uh, Community Health Needs Assessment Forum that took place back in November, and we'll be working with Huggins as well, because theirs will be coming out um, later on this spring. Um, and we also uh, work with Huggins Hospital's uh, Rural Health Network, um, which is really about increasing access um, to uh, services for important rural communities that are in um, Southern Carroll County. And lastly, our last initiative is uh, Early Childhood and Parental Support. Um, there's a group called the Carroll County Early Childhood um, Coalition, and um, we convene regularly um, to bring together uh, providers across the whole spectrum of early childhood um, services, from home visitors to the early childhood centers um, and local SAUs. Um, so those are the six priorities. Um, just lastly, um, we just kind of want to invite the delegation to use this as a resource for any um, for any questions you may have or any you want to bounce off ideas related to the uh, health of the public in Carroll County, um, we're definitely here for that. We have our contact information in the folder there. There's uh, all of our business cards on the left hand side. Um, and and also invite um, invite uh, any of the delegation members or anyone here really to um, to come to any of our meetings to um, be involved in the work that we're doing and. Again, thank you for your time, and I don't know if there are any questions, but... Uh... Yes, I, I want to thank uh, Carroll County Coalition for coming today. I truly enjoyed meeting with you, and I continue to do, continue to do so, insofar as it doesn't conflict with some of my other duties. Uh, I do want to report, in case you have not yet heard, you probably have, 
that the two bills you asked me to file have done quite well. Uh, House Bill 369 to address the PDNP to reduce the diversion of Suboxone has passed both houses and is before the governor. Um, House Bill 511 has passed both houses in slightly different versions and there's also a conflict with a provision in the budget. Uh, and I suspect at one point a committee of conference, but I believe that we have reached agreement amongst the various parties in advance of that. So uh, I, I've done my best for you, and, and we will continue to do so. And we want to thank you very much for your support. It, it means a lot. Thank you. And uh, just on that, um, on the topic of involvement, if you look at the uh, left hand side, you'll see a list of our meetings. That's for the rest of our fiscal year, which runs through um, mm -hmm. June 30th. Uh, so many different fiscal years out there, it's hard to keep track, right now. Um, but, uh, and you'll see that they, there's some, some information about the meetings that regularly occur, so like the uh, Carroll County Response meeting regularly occurs bi-monthly, and it's always um, open, and you're always welcome to attend. But no further questions, that's it, and thank I you for your time. Sure. Um, in the early childhood, you know, Karen, can you work at the Children's Center in Northville as well? Uh, we do. Um, it's sort of more on the periphery. We're trying to increase involvement because, um, as, as you know, the county tends to polarize around service between the southern part of the county and the northern part of the county. Yeah. Um, so we're really trying. There's uh, recently uh, Children Unlimited, which has the um, the Family Resource Center for the for the county um, has been awarded uh, some some funding through uh, New Hampshire Preschool Development Grants. So we're really going to be trying to coordinate services across the county better. So. Short answer, yes, we do, but uh, longer answer, we could do more, and we're trying to do more. Well, I, I know because I've known the children for 25 years, yeah. and we used to work very closely with children unlimited. We did the southern half of the county, mm -hmm. they cut the northern half, and we worked very closely together. And I didn't know if that relationship was still there. Yeah, it's, it's still there for sure, but yeah, we definitely can, we'll, we'll do our best to sort of bring it. Are there any further questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate your. Oh, I'm sorry. We have partners yes. that partnership with them, and they send us a lot of stuff, and we do work with them on quite a few different things for our programs. And I'm supposed to sit on the board when I can make when some time. Keep trying. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really important for us to work together and not duplicate. So I think that having someone who's kind of coordinating, I think, is really important. So we thank you for your work. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one is Dale Drew, and he is going to talk to us about the land committee, which I knew very little about until I was asked to sit on it. And they're doing some exciting things, so I invited them to come and share with us. Hi, I'm uh, Dale Drew. I'm uh, the chair of the Land Advisory Committee that was put together by the Carroll County Commissioners approximately two years ago. Um, Steve Knox was the chair. He stepped down approximately six months ago. I was elected. Uh, the focus from the beginning was to try to create programs and projects and things on property that best suited the land that was here. Uh, we've gone from one end of the spectrum to the other this spring. We're sort of focusing on things, projects that we want to complete sooner rather than later. We had a broad scope at the beginning. We're sort of bringing it into focus now. Uh, one of the, the big projects that's going to happen this spring is a handicapped accessible uh, trail on property. Um, we have secured um, a construction company who will build it. Uh, we looked into the local high schools to build benches and flowers and birdhouses so residents and people can use this trail. Uh, another project, we, one of our committee members, uh, Susan Gadette, uh, has been working with Wendy, the town forester, on mapping the property and all the logging roads. Uh, three purposes. Uh, horse trails, equine, uh, bike trails, and walking trails in the summer, and cross-country ski in the winter. Horseshoe, or snowshoe, not horseshoe. <laughs> Snowshoeing in the winter. Um, all those projects are are active and um, moving forward. Hopefully, this summer, by this fall, we should have. Well, actually, we had last Thursday one of our members, I, Georgine Salinger. Salinger, brought her. She's a local uh, 
Oh, it's a stable. And she brought a horse over and she mapped out some trails that she thought would be great for equine. So we're working with her on that and we're also trying to plan an equine weekend here, uh, the 1st and 2nd of June, and we've invited 10 or 12 of the local stables. Um, the problem we're finding with that in June is, as everyone's aware, winter was miserable this year, so they're way behind on getting stuff ready, so we might try to plan that either late summer, early fall, if we can't get it done this year. It just spread. <laughs> um, again, with the mapping, the bike trails are there, the, uh, and the uh, walking trails as well. Um, another project that we've started is we want to try to bring people to the property. A lot of people don't realize the resources here on property. Um, so and we wanted to work together with the nursing home as much as we can. So we've started a project of uh, planting vegetables, flowers, or whatever they want to plant with the residents and we're bringing in local schools, kids, to work with the residents to maintain, plant, harvest. Um, our focus is these people that are in this nursing home have a lot of knowledge and a lot of stories. And kids can learn so much. And it helps interactions. And we've had commitments from the uh, Conway Rec Department for every other week to come down here for four to five hours a week every other week to work with the residents. I have commitments from two local businesses in Carroll County who are gonna donate the materials, the soil, and a lot of the, the plants that we can't plant from seed for these beds. Um, and they will be built by them as well. well. I think the plan is to put 10 beds in the, if you're looking out from the front of the nursing home on the right side of the parking lot, so it's accessible for some of the residents in wheelchairs that can get out there. Um, I think I've covered, oh, my mom, that's my project. Oh yeah, the blueberries. I'm sure you guys are aware of the blueberries. We started last year. Um, the last year was a pretty good year as far as coming into it for as late as we did. Um, they made, I think the Boy Scouts from Madison, North Conway, made approximately $700 on the blueberries, and then we had uh, a bird issue. Um, they were a little quicker than we were. Um, this year, we have letters. There's two companies that build uh, special lasers that keep the birds away. Um, they're on timers, they're safe. Um, I'm trying to work it to, there's not a lot of these on the east side of the Mississippi River. So I'm working the angle of, if you want to put this in here, and then you can show it off to everyone who wants to buy it in the blueberry industry, we'd be a good example for you. Uh, if that doesn't work, we're looking at netting. Um, the scouts are really active this year. I think they already had one work date on the 22nd of April. I think they're planning another one for next week. Fertilizer will go down, and the mowing, and the weeding, and more. If you've gone over there, if you haven't gone over there, you should. Uh, they've mulched, I think, four of the older rows. There's 1,350 plants over there. Um, so they, they are bringing them back. They were going south quickly, but they've, they've, the kids are really into it. They're learning business, they're learning agriculture, they're, uh, they camp over there a couple of nights on a weekend and work Saturday and Sunday, camping Friday and Saturday night. Uh, they're having a blast. Um, and they're also willing to help out with these trails when we build them. And now that I've remembered, we also are working with uh, many trail groups, equine groups and bike groups who are going to come help build these trails as well. So I'm hoping, our goal is to not have any cost come out of the county for this, for any of these projects. And we do have other projects that are still in the infancy stage that I'll update you on when I have more information. But that's about it. The survey? Hmm? Our survey? Oh, the survey, the farmer survey, yeah. we. As you're aware, we put in for a grant last year that uh, we did not receive. So we spent five, four or five months building our own survey 
to send to farmers and residents in Carroll County and surrounding areas. Um, we should have copies of that. Um, I, Amanda? Okay. They're in my office. Okay. If anyone would like to stop by my office, I certainly will have them for you. They're also on the county website. Right, exactly. If you go that. to the county website and under search, just put in farm survey and it will come right up for you. We're, we're trying to figure out what... We had listening sessions at the beginning of this two years ago where we went to three different areas of the county, got input from the public, and we're trying to go through each one of those and figure out which ones are feasible for us to do. Uh, just to, like an agricultural learning center. Um, hopefully something with maybe the commercial kitchen and the old nursing home. Because value added is huge. And uh, if we can get some agricultural going here again, as some of you are aware, or most of you are aware, local is becoming very popular again. And we're hoping we can tag on to that and bring some life back into the town. So I think that's it. Any questions? Yes? Uh, where are the blueberry fields or bushes? The blueberry bushes are across the street from the town, from the Public Works building. Uh, they're in the middle of that hay field over there. There's a little elf building there. Thank you. Any more work on a co-op over here for like a depot for local people to bring their food and we can make one call and get 150 dozen eggs for a weekend <laughs> or 30 pounds of tomatoes or that something That is like on that. the list. Um, right now we're trying to focus on things that we can get done. We're looking to get some momentum. So if we can say this is the project we're doing and then complete it, maybe we're hoping that will bring more people here and then we can start to go on the bigger things like the food cooperative the commercial kitchen, the agricultural learning center. We, we've been doing at this for two years, and I, I, I don't think we're going to slow down anytime soon. I just want to make sure because there's a lot of money that leaves Cattle County in food purchases. I'm very aware. <laughs> very aware. Uh, so, yeah, in my background, I'm a local farmer. I live in Conway. And uh, land is, you don't have land anymore. No one has land. So to have this resource is huge, and it could be great if we do it the right way. And with support from the delegation and the commissioners, I think it would, it would, it would be excellent. Yes. Did your survey include, uh, I'm trying to look it up now, um, anything about uh, doing a farmer's market um, on any of the county land? The moving, or moving one of our, uh, or picking another day, moving one of our other uh, farmer's markets to here, to the area. One of the ideas is to bring beginner farmers or farmers that don't have enough land maybe into this property and then that would help with the cooperative, the, the food hub, if you so, mm -hmm. and a farmer's market. Um, on a smaller scale, those 10 beds out there, uh, we're going to try to do something with the kids and the residents to either do a farmer's market with the stuff they grow or have like a harvest dinner at the end of the year to celebrate everything. We just want to bring people here and if we can get the people to come here, then we can grow with the bigger ideas, which I have plenty of. Do you have a, a time when your trails are going to be up and running? We're hoping, we're hoping the, uh, the Handicap Accessible Trail will be early summer and we're looking at the equine trails and some of the walking trails uh, by the end of the year. There's out behind the, uh, the building up at the front, there's already some trails that were partially built. There's three legs. The first leg is almost complete. And we, once we get all our ducks in a row, which we want to have before we start bringing people here, um, then we will jump right on them. And they should, all three of those legs should be done by fall this year. And how will people be able to access those maps? Oh, we, are, you, are you planning on putting them on the website? Oh, we'll, we'll put them on the website. We'll put them at a kiosk at the entrances to the to the and advertising. Will you work with uh, the, like with the towns and their? Um, uh, right now, we're trying to work with the local like running groups and biking groups. That's where most most of most people belong to these groups. And then if they don't, they know people who belong to the groups. 
So we're hoping that we'll bring more people here. And just word of mouth and advertising. And, and we're trying to do a lot of, uh, uh, like Dam Damon has helped us out tremendously with getting our information out there. And I'm hoping you will in the future. Working with any chamber of commerces? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Anything else? Um, Ma'am, would you please identify yourself just for a minute? Um, I'm Barbara Stay from okay. Wolf Girl. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Catalina Kirsch with Carroll County Collision. Um, are you connected with the uh, age friendly communities groups that are working on, uh, they're trying to develop a list of accessible walking trails across the region? And Sounds to me like you have very similar goals. I, I, was not a, I don't think trail. we are aware of that. They, I think they are mostly focused around the Mount Washington Valley and Western Maine. However, as I hear you describe this, it completely aligns with the type of work we're trying to do. So we would be happy to connect you with them so that you can help each other's cause. That would be wonderful. Thank you. We actually have a committee meeting right after this meeting is over. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Are there no other questions? Thank, Thank you, you very, very much for much. your time. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Representative Okay, I've got a little presentation about the broadband access initiative that's going on. Let me actually, give, just in case you want this, but okay. I've got, oops, sorry. Um, so I have, there's two handouts. One is mine. The other is actually from... Uh, Rick Hyland and Steve Knox. There should be enough to get that one through to Joe and this one through uh, to Ken. And so anyway, basically I mentioned this a couple of months ago, but it was the middle of the budget process, so it wasn't a time we could spend any time on it. But I've gotten involved with a, a group that's working on broadband access. Uh, there was a nice article in the paper about a month ago after their last meeting in March. And as you know, broadband access really is critical to economic development. Um, and it, it's something that's become basically critical infrastructure. And unfortunately for many of us in the rural aspects of Carroll County, we don't have access to it. And it's not unique to Carroll County, but it certainly is particularly problematic in the rural areas. Um, and it's a lot more than just being able to stream your local Netflix. The bottom line is that you really need it for economic development. You need it for running a business. Uh, kids need it for school. Um, the... Uh, the um, Market innkeepers, restaurateurs, they need it for their marketing, for their, uh, for their reservations, all that kind of stuff. And uh, likewise, uh, and both uh, Representative Marsh and I spend a lot of time, or some time, listening to telemedicine bills. Uh, the field of telemedicine is really uh, expanding. And you think of the double whammy we have up here. Um, you're in a rural area where you haven't got the specialists. So, hey, we got some great ideas of how we can do telemedicine, get you access to a specialist in Boston. Oh, but you haven't got the connection, so we can't do it. Because a lot of these bills are now enabling that when the uh, visiting nurse goes and makes the home call, they can do a telemedicine connection into the dock because these people are not mobile. It costs a lot to get them transportation into the dock and that kind of stuff. And if they can do it that way, it's great. We saw one of the coolest things in a bill about a week ago uh, where a school nurse has set up a deal. Not a school nurse. It's a nurse. Uh, has set up a deal with school nursing. So that if a kid is there, then the kid doesn't have to come out of school, the parents don't have to come from work. And then including a little thing you can pop in the ear, and but telemedicine, you can look at the eardrum. Now that was really a nice little thing. So the point is there's real need, and our citizens are going to be left behind in terms of health access if we don't have this. So anyway, bottom line is, the, sorry, the bottom line, but another feature is we also really need to uh, recruit and, and, and keep, get people that are young to stay in our area as workers. And a lot of them don't have a lot of interest in living someplace. Actually, our youngest son, age 30, and his wife just moved up to Eaton. They have incredible difficulties with getting any kind of uh, broadband access on the remote hill where they live. And so, I mean, there's no fiber. And it's a matter of trying to use satellite. That doesn't work very well. So the bottom line is the cable companies haven't got a whole lot of reason to run fiber for that last little bit. They are not required to when they get below a certain population density. Um, in, in a free market sense, it doesn't make any sense for them to run it out because they're never going to recoup their, uh, their investment on that, or at least they would think they would not. And um, the, if you think about it, this is a lot like 
electrification was in this country in the 30s and 40s. We had vast amounts of rural areas that didn't have electricity. And the government recognized this was a problem. We needed to deal with it. There was a strong initiative to get rural electrification done. A lot of that done during the 30s and 40s. Steve Knox involved in this said his neck of the woods in Albany didn't get electricity until the 40s and didn't get telephone until far after that. So broadband is kind of right up there with that. So I've mentioned these names a couple times. Rick Highland, Steve Knox, their handout is the, is the one-page handout. This is what they use when they're going to the various people uh, in various select boards. When I was running, I was interested in kind of working on this and was planning to get together some people, but I didn't need to because Rick and Steve had gotten this started. They've started it. They've gotten, we've got a couple different meetings. I was only able to make it to one of the meetings. And this is to get the stakeholders together, to get the people who have been doing this with them, learn about it. Kara Miller from the state who does this was at the first meeting, and get some ideas about the best way to do it. What they recognize is it's very difficult for a single town to bond something like this and get this service rolled out. So they're looking at trying to build a consortium of towns that would get together and agree on ways in which they could do this. Um, and there are some issues about the bonding, which I'll go over in just a moment. Um, the idea we also talked about, you know, 5G, everybody hears about that. That's great for urban areas. You need a repeater about every thousand feet. Uh, it's not going to be economically feasible for us in the rural area. Fiber optic is really basically the scalable uh, option that we could go with that should be good for a very long time. And last year, the legislature passed SB 170. It was signed into law allowing municipalities to bond for these things. And Chesterfield already has been working on that. They're the first one. And they've got a, a degree, a, 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 an agreement they're working on with Consolidated to try to get uh, a bonding where the Consolidated takes the risk and they charge the uh, subscribers a small fee. Um, and that's in that model, the internet provider still owns the system and they recoup their fees from the uh, subscribers. But another alternative is for a town to build its own, but then they've got the problem of maintenance, they've got that and outsource that, but that's another option. It's important to realize this committee is just in the process of still gathering information. They're not making decisions yet. SB 103 is a bill in the legislature this year. It's gone through the Senate, it's had its hearing in the House. Um, I don't know when we're going to be getting it. But that would allow multiple towns to come together and bond uh, various things, including broadband access. Um, that, that's the, the advantage of that, it gives you more leverage. Larger uh, uh, base of customers and a larger geographic area. But at the first meeting, I brought up the question of whether or not the county should get involved. Because the county could get involved. And it, it, basically, they're forming a consortium of towns. Well, we are a consortium of towns. We're all the towns. And we could conceivably work with them as sort of the umbrella municip municipal organization that is helps them with the bonding and with the you know getting uh, the critical mass of, of people in. That they thought that was a good idea. We're kind of proceeding along. They're moving ahead with their process of getting towns to buy in. And I wanted to bring it up here to see if the, if the county delegation and commissioners were interested in getting involved with this in the standpoint of just doing the planning, not making any commitments yet. Um, there's also federal money to be leveraged for this infrastructure development as well. But we, you know, we can't leave it on the table. It would be nice to actually get it. So again, Highland and Knox put together these non-binding committees. And they've gone over, this is what they present when they go to talk to a board of selectmen. Already towns that have bought into it are Sandwich, Albany, Tamworth, Hearts Location, Chatham, and Edom. Some of them already have designated a select board person who is going to be the representative to go to the meetings. And the idea of this, by saying non-binding, they get together, they plan it, they come up with an idea. But it's non-binding. At any point, any of those towns can say, no, this doesn't work for us in Midwater. Likewise, if the county says we want to perhaps be involved, if it gets to the point that it's getting, you know, built in, um, oh, sorry, I didn't go. Yeah, we didn't get it on the side. Oh, yeah, well, I, just, I, I just sent them down. I just saw oh, the spot. Oh, right here. Uh, yeah, there, here's the whole pile because I had them all pre-counted so that it would. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> it was one for each. Anyway, so uh, the idea is the county might want to work on it, and then if the county decides this isn't going to work for us, we would also just walk because it is non-binding. So what I'm asking is, number one, would the commissioners and county delegation be interested in having somebody work with them to kind of keep this the ball rolling? 
Again, we don't need to do this because, and you all remember Steve Knox for his work, we have already mentioned a little bit earlier, not today. He does a great job. He's really on this. He's, I think he's working full time on this. And Rick Hyland, a uh, select uh, board in Albany, is uh, the two of them are working really hard together. We do not need to redo what they're doing. They've got it going. I think the issue would be supporting them, um, perhaps having somebody sitting on their board with them, and then whether or not, if ultimately, particularly if 103 doesn't pass, uh, if the whole county wants to get involved, to have the county become the bonding uh, responsible municipality for bond for governmental division to do the bonding. So that's what it's all about. So I've given you both hands up so you can think about it. We don't necessarily have to make a decision today, except if we wanted to at least say we'd like to have somebody that goes to the meeting and keeps, keeps us appraised of what's going on. That would be a good decision to make today. We don't have to make any decisions about bonding. Uh, if, we're, if the county has a feeling about whether they'd like to get involved, that I can take that back to that committee uh, because we don't even know if bonding is the structure they would move with. They're still gathering information, looking at what's been done in Vermont, looking at what's been done all around the country. UNH has a bunch of stuff on this, and Carol Miller. So that's where that stands. I can take questions if you have questions. Question. Yes, Jason. I have a question, but just so you know, for um, the National Association of Counties, NACO, which is a 100% compliant, and we actually have two uh, votes on their board. One of their big initiatives is rural broadband. And on March 18, 2019, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sony Purdue, they launched an app um, that helps measure the signal strength of connectivity on all broadband. So yeah. that is also one of their goals, which the commissioners through Association of Counties, um, we have some leverage there and a lot of information that, that's on that. Just want to throw out there. And for telemedicine, they're right, we have it over the jail as well. Look up the stethoscope, glucometer, blood pressure, and the else in the doctor, and I can read it all. It's, uh, it's coming that way, it's fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I take the motion, Madam Chair. Yes. Motion to have Representative Kennard be the delegation rep to the MWVBFI, <laughs> which is the Mount Washington Valley Broadband Fiber Initiative. I'll second that. <laughs> we have the motion that's made, it has been seconded. Uh, for the discussion. Representative Butler. Thank you. Um, as much as I support this effort, um, I don't, since there are going to be, it's going to be a town by town uh, uh, involvement, um, and whether or not the towns can be, be a part of this multi town uh, bonding process, I'm pretty, I can't imagine that. Uh, the bill won't be supported. I certainly hope it is. Uh, uh, okay. And, and uh, it had a hearing on the 30th uh, in the House and it passed the Senate. So um, I just don't know what the county's involvement would be because the investment's going to need to be on a town by town basis. But I have no problem with Representative Knirk being a representative for the county. <laughs> well, I'll be call. respond back yes. to that. Yes. Uh, they actually, yes, it, it, it seemed like this was on a clear path, but then the lobbying groups of the telecoms came out of the woodwork because they really kind of don't want this because they want to, they're, they're perfectly happy, you know, with high density where they can get a lot of money and they don't want to do the rest of it. So there has been some really strong opposition. So I think we have to be a little cautious to assume it's a fait accompli. Number one. Number two is, yeah, the town by town. But, but basically, you have to have a municipal structure to, or a sorry, governmental division to do the bonding. Right now, a single town can do that. But to have each single town do its own bonding thing with each different provider is going to become kind of small. Not very many people, not very many customers, I don't think. Not very many customers involved, and it might not have much leverage. The consortium hopefully could make it work better. But the county is sort of, I feel, the ultimate consortium where it would just really be the bonding agent. Again, towns might opt out. They might not participate. But I don't know enough to know how that would work at this point. And so we, that's, that's, I say, we're only gathering info. And we may say, look, the county supports the concept, and we're not going to get involved in the bonding. That's fine, too. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm going to concerned it's called the Mount Washington Valley something. I am elected by the people in all of the county, but my representative district is the lower third of the county. 
which I do not believe is included in the Mount Washington Valley. Well, it, it, again, I think that's just the name. The town's involved. The sandwich is already involved. They're not part of the Mount Washington Valley. Um, Eaton, I think you could say is, maybe isn't. Chatham, plus minus, it's really kind of the other side of the mountain range. Right? So this, that's a name that's been given to it, but it doesn't have a lot to do with the reality. They're trying to get every town in the county involved. We might encourage them to broaden the name. Yes, I think it's going to be a change name. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that there is a motion on the floor that we're straying from the uh, Yes, we are. Okay, well, I've been motion. Just, there you go. Okay, then I will I will call the call the roll. Clerk will vote yes. Representative Buco? Yes. Representative Butler? Yes. Representative Cordelli? Yes. Representative Nelson? Yes. Representative Como? Yes. Representative Canary? I guess so. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Marsh? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Woodcock? Yes, well, thank and, you. And the chair? Yes. Great. Well, can I just ask a question then about the group? First, uh, Representative Butler said that he's not so sure the county should get involved. Can I just get a sense to get feedback back to the committee? Is that kind of uniform amongst this delegation, or are some people interested? Madam Chair, if I could yes. clarify. Um, I am fine for uh, continuing exploration, um, but my my basic uh, concern is that you know there are some towns, Goldsboro maybe, Conway maybe, that are already working on their own infrastructure issues relative to broadband, and we represent all the towns in the. Uh, so how we would how the county would uh, support some towns and not others to be in a coalition is. Uh, difficult for me, but I'm all for um, exploration. Okay. I think we must that way. Yes, Representative Revelani. I, I share uh, Representative Butler's concerns. Um, there are other towns that have explored and expanded their infrastructure for broadband. Uh, Wakefield would be one of them, working with the um, uh, spectrum. At the time that I was there, we, we really got on them about expanding it to the rural areas. So I don't know if we would be that town would be um, part of the consortium. I'm sure there's some outliers, but uh, most of it is seasonal. Yes, I do, uh, also share your concern, Representative Butler, but I think our function might very well be passing information along to the towns we represent. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Mr. Rubin. Although um, the county would would uh, would a would the acceptance of a grant maybe by the county. Um, apparently NACO has $600 million uh, grant, in grant money set aside for, yeah, we'll for some of that. <laughs> so, so would you be interested in that type of I mean, it'd have to come to the county. The county would have to distribute it. But right. and who's the organization on that? Uh, NACO, the, the, uh, the National Association of the County. Of the county. Right and again, I'll say that New Hampshire is 100% compliant, so you do have, which is more law state, so we do have two seating, uh, two votes on there. Um, and New Hampshire Association County is a very strong group that goes out there, so you do have some leverage to look at that kind of one. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on because okay, um, we have one more thing. Uh, we have a quick Siemens update on the Siemens project. Yeah. I don't want to forget that because our lunch is out there waiting for us. Right, and um, Madam Chair, I still have one more piece of other business. Oh, if um, if you all go ahead. Go if you all remember, we we um, we all entered into an agreement with Siemens to replace a lot of our interest, our aging infrastructure, um, <laughs> and so we're going to give you a quick update and um, of what we've done and how much is left to do. So, uh, this the project has started. Uh, it's gone on wonderfully so far. Ninety-five percent of all the lighting in the buildings has been changed over. We're running on LED lights right now. And uh, we're already realizing savings in our electric bills. It's, it's amazing. Um, I can't wait to see what the next bill looks like, because that's when we're going to see the majority of the work that's been done show up. Uh, the HVAC work uh, has largely been commencing at the jail and at the administration building. Uh, the administration building should see it functional uh, in about three weeks. The jail, um, I, uh, sometime early June. 
the roof on the administration building is, should be done by the end of May. Um, control work is going to continue to make these systems functional. And I think uh, I think we spent about 1.8 million dollars so far. Um, so it's just moving along. It's going well. Um, we're going to be uh, the boilers are going to be installed in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. Along with the uh, so the rest of the HVACs, uh, the, the condensers at the administration building will be put outside. Um, a lot of the a lot of the offices have have individual cassettes. Um, and you've seen that in the uh, in the delegation. Right, you've seen the delegation was a big thing. Uh, and what's that mean in a cassette? They have ceiling cassette, wall cassette. They're called cassettes. Uh, it's the it's the indoor HVAC unit that you see oh, you know, yeah. on the wall or in the ceiling. Much more efficient. Yep. Uh, and um, so they're going to be pouring a pad in a couple weeks outside, the, up back in the administration building. We've moved the the temporary um, uh, generator. generator out so they can pour the, the uh, pad. And um, HVAC might be ready by May in the jail. We hope so. Uh, probably June. Uh, Oil system's going to start in end of May. Yes. So everything's going well. We, we look to, to realize some really good savings uh, in the next meeting season. Um, I was unaware that that the that we're going to have two sources of, of heat in the building at admin. One, the boilers, and two, the cassettes can also. Yeah, the HVAC system that they're installing is what they call variable refrigerant flow. Um, it takes heat from different areas of the building, moves it to others. It takes heat from outside, moves it to others. Heat from inside, moves it out. It's just without a fuel source. So it's, we're looking forward to the yeah. savings. Good stuff. Okay. That's it. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, they look so much. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a question. I'll be confused. I'm moving things along. What is the end date for all the work, Bob? I think that they're going to be done around August. With the entire? With, with everything, yeah. yeah. That end date, you know, it floats based on weather <laughs> and whatnot. But, uh, Thank you for your work on this. Yeah, glad to. Thank you. It's fun. It's fun. It really is. I enjoy this. It's just amazing. Yes. Did you question this or are you back on your back on my next item? Did you I wondered if uh, after Representative Butler um, gives his question if you would like a quick update on the revenue with the registry. Okay, thank you. And my question uh, or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a follow up is on assisted living. Um, and we uh, authorized uh, money for the study, correct? Yes. And, um, and uh, how is that proceeding, or is it proceeding, or when will it proceed? It has, it has not proceeded at this, at this moment, um, although Howie does have some information. Yeah, I've been in contact with two or three consultants, and we're putting together an RFP. Um, looking for a comprehensive RFP, actually building on what Bob has been able to do with Siemens, an RFP that would also include not just what we need, but how it can be financed, structured, developed, and built so that it would be a comprehensive package. My goal is so that to anticipate any questions that anybody might have and for an independent party to be able to assess whether it makes sense or what, 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 what we need or, and if it makes sense right down to the details of what the cost of financing would be if it did. Madam Chair, follow-up? And what's your timeline? I'd, I'd like to see us get the an RFP out no later than Memorial Day. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say that one. Uh, just a question for Howie, real quick. Um, are you looking at all aspects, including adding on to this building that was... In fact, that? my understanding is that the focus is narrow and it only anticipates that the, the overall goal was that at this point, that any expansion to off-site, not Conway or any other place, would be in a, a, an entirely different phase. So looking at something that's actually a, a more manageable, which would be the addition to this building, which was anticipated when this building was built. Yes. If it was added on to this building with part of the Siemens contract, could we expand part of the Siemens contract to include some of those updated 
um, things. Maybe we can get the boilers over here in the expansion or something like that included in the RFP so we're not having the annex as well. Definitely. In fact, that would be this. the nice part about this building, that addition, although it wasn't anticipated for assisted living, it was anticipated for expansion of nursing, all the infrastructure, whether it be power, sewer, and, and heat, was anticipated. So the improvements, and I'll work with Bob to be sure that anything, although in this building, the Siemens involved, and I'll let Bob correct me if I'm wrong, was pretty much limited to light conversion to, to um, LEDs. Yeah, the work, the work that they're doing in this building is essentially uh, lighting and uh, building controls. Uh, I, I wouldn't think it would be part of an expansion of the Siemens project. I think they would be totally separate entities, but uh, we would certainly be consulting with them moving forward. How about moving the laundry over here? Oh, definitely. Oh, I'd love oh, that idea. I'd want a full basement. Yeah, yeah. You're talking would, that, about would, that be, would that be part of the expansion that, that, as well? That, that's part of the RFP because we want to. There aren't many things that we need to correct about this building. The laundry is one. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this topic? I, yes, Madam Chairman, I would like to just point out that the current Board of Commissioners have in no way approved any of this. Other than the fact that we have a new budget. Madam Registrar. During the earlier part of the meetings, there was a discussion of the revenue part of the budget, so I wonder if you would like an update. Yeah. So through April, through the end of April, the number of transfers, the volume of uh, documents that have passed through the office has, compared to last year, gone down. Yet, the revenue has increased for, this, for the first four months of the year when you compare it to last year, 8%. Gross revenue. Most of that is going to the state. 1% increase is going to the county. And what that means to me is that the real estate prices are higher now than in the past and we're getting more money in from the transfer tax. And the county keeps 4% of that, and the state gets the 96%. So we're doing fine in terms of meeting our budget expectations. And it's a different change in the market. The things, the real estate volume is slowing down. And the prices are right up there. That's all. Yes, I'm that Not on that issue. We've done that. Let me go back to the commissioner's statement um, about the possible assisted living in the survey, the assisted living, and you said that the three commissioners um, haven't, I, I couldn't quite grasp it, saying they haven't supported it, they haven't uh, released it, or, I mean, I'm, I'm, We have not discussed it. So what does that mean in terms of the survey? Well, or the proposal? If there is going to be a feasibility study, the three commissioners have to approve the RFP. Okay. I mean, the, then we have not. Before it goes up. Correct. Okay. So this is not to be construed as they're not in support of the the possible extension, the possible. I, I have no idea because we have not discussed it. We haven't had it in, in the meeting. It. Yeah, it was in your budget. Fair enough. Hmm? It was in the budget that hmm. was passed. There was money in there to pay for the feasibility study. Okay. Was that money put in by, by the commissioner? The last board of commissioners presented the budget to this delegation. Okay, but it didn't pass the rest, right? The last board of commissioners did not support yes. the service. No, the last board of commissioners put the budget in and approved it and it was passed by this board of del this delegation okay. but so, the current board of commissioners have not discussed it 
or the cross board of voters. Current board of commissioners to put it on there. Next board of voters, so we, yes. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little. But I just wanted the delegation to know that we have not discussed okay. it. Okay, so I point of order, Madam Chair. Yes. We have, we have yeah. the questions coming from the chair. Keep, keep playing. The discussion yes. going. Sorry. We're getting into a back and forth here. Um, that's okay. Um, so I just to, can we just clarify and ask one question? What we're um, you go right the question is. I've already put it on the floor. Can go no, I think I think what I'm trying to, I'm understanding is that the question is this. Board of Commissioners, the current Board of Commissioners has not approved it because it's put in the budget by the previous Board of Commissioners. And I think the question we're trying to arrive at, does you have not voted on it, does this mean you do not approve of it or you just have not voted on it? We have not discussed it. You haven't discussed it. We don't discuss things unless we do it in, in a meeting in public. Oh, okay. And we have not done that. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. So I've we tried don't know if it's yes or no. Okay. I've tried for many years, but I'm not a very good mind reader. So, <laughs> okay. I, but I did want that brought forth. Yes, we appreciate that. And, um, and I think that that's important for us to know. And I think um, it might be something before we move forward that, that perhaps you do take up before we waste the time of our of everybody working on it. So, thank you. so I think is there anything else to come before the meeting? You have some public comment. Um, we have public comment. Yes. Just a brief comment to promote the fact that tomorrow is Valley Pride Day across 32 communities across Carroll County and Western Maine. So I invite you to, as our local representatives to be a part of it, to share that word out among your constituents and to help beautify and uh, clean up the litter on our roadsides and so we get off to a really nice spring in our county. So the more information is available on Facebook and they're after the morning cleanups uh, with check-in stations at towns across the region there will be a celebration at Hampton Inn from 12 to 2. So thank you for helping me to spread the word on that event. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Anything further? Seeing none, our lunch is waiting for us. Motion to adjourn. So we have a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second.